So first and foremost, I would like to say thank you all for uh, attending on this beautiful uh, Saturday morning or afternoon, depending on what part of the planet you're on. Uh, and we have a very uh, special and lovely uh, celebration of arts and sciences today where we focus on uh, music and sound. And we have two wonderful, uh, wonderful speakers. And yes, in the case of Brother Ranesh, good evening to you. I hope the weather is uh, lovely over here in India. So, um, with that being said, I, I would like to also thank uh, the Maine Masonic Foundation, which helps fund the, uh, the Maine Masonic College and allows us to uh, do the activities that we do on a regular basis, not just our regular reoccurring courses, but also our celebration of arts and sciences in the spring and our convocation in the fall. My name is Luke Shorty. I'm the Dean of the Maine Masonic College. Uh, and I'm, I'm excited and glad to welcome you all here today. For a little background on the Maine Masonic College, since its founding in 2005, the Maine Masonic College has worked on developing qualified faculty to share their personal expertise and their dedication to learning. It is the college's goal to offer two classes per month free of charge and open to the public. In addition, there are two semi-annual events, the Celebration of Arts and Sciences, which we are at today, and the College Convocation each which feature prominent guest speakers who are leaders in their fields. Today is no exception. The college has developed strong educational partnerships outside the craft with the University of Maine Honors Program, which we'll be hearing from later this, uh, this program, as well as the University of Maine's Planetarium. We'll take part in National History Day and provide financial support and volunteer hours to youth betterment initiatives to strengthen children's love for learning. As Masons, we know from our ritual about the importance of studying the seven liberal arts and sciences, which is we pick one and we celebrate it at our celebration of arts and sciences today. These traditionally were grammar, rhetoric, logic, arithmetic, geometry, music, and astronomy. But in the modern world, as we all know, they have come to encompass the humanities, social sciences, and performance and fine arts as well. And it's from this broad foundation that the Masonic College creates our programs which include topics of interest to anyone with an inquisitive mind, whether they are a Freemason or not. While our classes may sometimes make reference to lessons that you learned in the craft, it is also our goal to academically engage with the general public to create programs which enrich and stimulate. As the college motto states, we seek to bring more light to everyone we meet. Uh, if you would like to know more information, you can always go to www.tobringmorelight Dot org. Again, that's www.tobringmorelight.org. Uh, thank you everyone for attending this Maine Masonic uh, College Celebration of Arts and Sciences, and I would like to introduce our first speaker today. With that being said, I'm going to pull up the, the bio. I have known uh, Professor Thompson for oh, a handful of years now. He is currently the chair of the University of Maine's Department of Physics and Astronomy. Uh, he has a passion and an interest in physics education and how physics is taught and the connection it has to mathematics. And with that, one of his other areas of interest is the conceptual understanding of sound at both the introductory level and among pre-service and in-service K-12 teachers, which is a subject that I'm very interested in. Uh, and with that, he's going to talk to us a little bit today about uh, the history and physics of, of sound and music. And with that, I'll try to keep these intros short and sweet to give our instructors as much time as possible. So please, brethren, join me in welcoming uh, Professor Thompson to our celebration of arts and sciences. Professor Thompson, welcome. Thanks very much. Thanks, Luke. Um, <clears throat> so let me share my screen here. I have uh, it, hearing all that. What your introduction of the of the Masonic College too? I realized we have a connection, right? The, the planetarium, the Versant Astronomy. Now the Versant Power Astronomy Center planetarium is underneath our department, and uh, so I'm pretty familiar with all their offerings, which is and it, I love what they do there. I think it's a very cool place. Um, yeah. So. Uh, and I appreciate the idea of 
of what the college stands for, that <clears throat> trying to you know, bring everybody and continue education and, and inform people about ideas and, and the humanities and the sciences always should go hand in hand. I'm, I'm a big fan of that. Uh, so I'll get started here. Um, yeah, I'm, just to, a little bit of addition to what Luke was saying. Um, so I have taught a class for pre-service teachers and one of the units I started working on was sound. And so some of the stuff I'm gonna talk about today is, is activities we do in there. And again, over Zoom, it's a little harder. If we were in person, I would be handing you all out tuning forks and other things and it would be a lot of more exciting. So imagine you get to do those things and we'll see how that goes. Um, we'll see how your imagination is. So, <laughs> uh, but I'm gonna go through a little bit of uh, the basic ideas behind sound and, and musical, like building up ideas about how musical instruments make sounds and what they do. And then I'm gonna end a little bit about hearing, but not very much, cause that's again, out of my depth, out of my field, but hopefully it, it sets us up a little bit to listen to, to Brian Harris and with his amazing work. So uh, yeah, and if you have questions, you know, unmute yourself and ask, that's fine. I, I may not be able to check on the chat at the same time. So, uh, uh, Professor Thompson, I can check on the chat for you and okay, I'll, that's I'll right. type up if something comes through the chat. That's super, thanks. You're very welcome. Oh. All right, so let's go here. So I wanna start, whoops, I gotta get on the right thing here. All right, so one question, right? The basic question I wanna ask is how are sound, what are sounds and how are they made? And, um, so let me show this video. I keep doing the wrong button. No, wait. Ugh. All right, hang on. I can do this. All right. So this is a video of a speaker playing a note in front of a candle, right? And I don't know if you can all see the candles vibrating, right? Back and forth. The flame is going back and forth. And the speaker, if you noticed, was also doing that, right? So the basic idea behind sound is it's, it's vibrations. Anything that vibrates technically could be called a sound. Uh, often it's supposed to be a regular uh, periodic vibration, right? So, uh, and when we get into physics, we, we talk about what's a longitudinal wave. Um, so you, you all have the understanding of waves, I think, and, and normally we think about waves that go up and down, like a, um, if I took a rope and I flipped it up and down, you'd see this up and down motion go across the screen. Uh, longitudinal waves are a little different. They move where the oscillation is going in the same direction that the wave is going. So I say that, I have a couple of pictures and hopefully that'll help clear some things up. So if you see at the end, the left end of this picture, there's a, a little thing moving back and forth, right? And so this is an air, um, this is sort of a model of what goes on. If, if something is, has a column of air and it's pushing back and forth repeatedly and, and regularly, right? So I want you to notice a few things in here. You can see sort of that little clump. It looks like a clump moving, clumps moving from left to right regularly across the screen. But if you notice some of those, there's a couple red dots in there and those are individual particles. And notice they're just going back and forth around some normal point, right? If that, if that thing on the left weren't moving, we would assume this air would all be distributed randomly and be sitting relatively still. I mean, that's not what really happens, right? It's always air bopping around, but we can, we can, we can dream. So, uh, so just this is a very important piece about sound that I think is easily misunderstood because of, of well, there's ads too. But so th this is a little more demonstration here that they point out. Um, what we talk about the wave is this variation of dense pockets of stuff and loose, uh, what's called rarefaction when you talk about gas. So there's compression. So if you had a slinky, you could imagine where it's all squished together and where it's all stretched out. But again, each particle is just going back and forth, but it's being hit and, and causing it to do different things at different times, but it's still only oscillating back and forth about some equilibrium position. So this is a very important distinction to make that uh, it doesn't, the air that may, that, that um, propagates the sound, that moves the sound from one place to another does not move with the sound, right? So it's not wind, sound is not wind. It's an oscillation that's traveling through the rope. So like, sorry, through the air, right? When we make a rope wave up and down, the rope doesn't fly along, but the wave does. It's the same idea, but it's going back and forth. Sorry, this way, if I do this, you can't tell. Okay, 
So, so that's the real basic idea is waves and they're waves that are oscillating in the same direction that they're moving. And that's the longitudinal part. All right, there is a, let me uh, go out here for a second. Do practice this, see if this will work. Uh, wait a minute, I gotta share a different screen. It's all this technology is so fantastic. So this one, so here's sound and we can adjust. This is one that we can tune a little bit. This is a great app. So I'm gonna make it a little bit, a very a faster frequency, right? So oscillating back and forth. And I don't know, now it's actually too fast, I think on the screen, but you can see again, this is the red dots are only going back and forth around some normal spot, but there's this oscillation going through. And that little blue up and down is what you would think of as how far those particles are moving from their normal position. So when the blue is high, anything in that line is moving very far away from where it would normally be at rest. Does that make sense? Anyone? Professor Thompson, is this app available to the public yes. or is this yes. in-house? No, no, this is this is out in the world. It's I, I have on the slides I have the, the link. Oh the wonderful. Slide. So yeah, hopefully when we go we'll go back, I'll you can go back and look at it. You can all spend the rest of the hour just playing with this if you want. That's this is fun. really cool looking. <laughs> yeah, it's really neat. And then this one has you can do transverse waves as well. Right. You so they talk about sound and rope, which is you know, but you can vary this how fast it's going and how big the oscillation is. So you can see just moving a little bit or moving a lot, right? Or and I have something way here. Um, high frequency, or, or, or not at all. Oh yeah, there's the rest, right? Not at all, it's not moving at all. And then something very slow back and forth. Okay, so let me go back to the, Talk here. I think that's the only one that's going to be super complicated to go back and forth with. All right. There we go. Okay, so yeah, so at the bottom is the link. So since this is being recorded, you can see that and, and find it at your at your leisure. I think I put most of the links for some of these places down at the bottom. So all right, so, so I, I give you this picture and I, I wanna emphasize this because I think this is something that is easily misunderstood and it's, I think, really helpful to understand it. Um, so sounds are mechanical waves. They just are stuff that's vibrating, but vibrating in a regular pattern, right? That's the big idea, right? So if nothing else gets done today, this is, to me, a triumph. So, uh, but there's a couple things to me that, that this implies that you wanna make sure you understand. So one is, the energy transmitted and propagated in the wave. So waves are a way to take energy from one place to another, right? The energy of that thing moving back and forth is transferred through those particles moving to something else. And then it gets, it makes something else move down the line and that takes energy. So this is an energy transfer mechanism. But the stuff, I'm getting really technical, stuff stays put, right? So the stuff that produced, that it's transmitting the energy and the wave doesn't go with the energy. And that's the amazing thing about waves. I have a strange question, Professor Thompson. Certainly. Um, so from my understanding of physics, it's forces that move particles. And so clearly things are being pushed yes. forward that move the particle to the right. Ah. What is the force that makes the particle <clears throat> move back to the left? That is an excellent question. Uh, thank you. So when it moves out, if, if you assume that the, the air in this case is sort of at equilibrium before this all starts going, right? When it gets too dense, there's a pressure gradient. So if it's being squished together, the air is gonna to wanna to spread back out, right? So everywhere where you see one of those dense places, the, the particles are like, no, 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 I wanna get away and it spreads out again to try to be in equilibrium. And that's where it ends up being, it sort of overcompensates and that's where you get to get what's called the rarefaction. And then that sort of gets pushed the other direction until it squishes up with everything else. And, and then 
all those particles decide that's too, well, they don't decide anything, right? But it's too crowded. <laughs> and then they push the other way. So it's basically just a, 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 a consistent force. So that's where the, the slinky idea, and it's hard to do a slinky longitudinally. So I didn't do that. I'm not good at the slinky thing myself. But if you, with the slinky, it's easier to think about because if you think about where a slinky is squished together, that's not a, it can't stay that way, right? It wants to spread back out to be evenly, evenly springy. So does that help? Absolutely. Thank you very much. Yeah. So, so that's a good thing to point out, and I'm sorry I didn't make that clear. That like the air has the springy properties in in general, like uh, like a slinky or springs that are, uh, and that's what keeps it that way. And in, in a solid, sound is transmitted right through metal and wood and all that stuff, and it's the same. But those particles actually are so solidly connected that the springs are very tight. And so that's why often the speed of sound is faster because it depends on how tight those bonds are. Okay. Yeah, there's a lot of depth to go. We can go off the rails very easily. So, and I'm happy to do that. <laughs> All right. Um, the other thing I wanna point out is because this sound needs stuff to travel through, if there's no stuff, there's no sound. So sound will not travel if there's a vacuum, if there's nothing for it to travel through. And I always think of this, this is one of my favorite slogans, right, from a movie, because there's physics in it, right? That if you remember a long time ago in Alien, the, the movie Alien came out, I think in the 80s, and their slogan was in space, no one can hear you scream, and physicists everywhere were like, thank you, yes. Because often in movies, there's sound out in space and we all shudder when that happens. That's like, everyone's like bad science in movies, like 90% of their examples are things in space movies where there's an explosion and you hear it. So that's not good. But, so that's another big important thing, right? It, it, and there's examples of people putting alarm clocks and bell jars and pumping out all the air and you can't hear it anymore. Uh, all right. And, and I want to say this is actually different from what we're used to thinking about, like light, electromagnetic waves, their electric fields, those actually can propagate through the vacuum, right? That's how we can see stars uh, that come from space. The light comes through vacuum of space and reaches us and we still see stuff and we see amazing things that happened billions of years ago, right? So that's a very different set of physics going on with electromagnetic waves, but sound is different and mechanical waves like this need something to travel through. Professor Thompson, one more question. If I sure. try to set off an old timey alarm clock or a bell in a vacuum, uh, clearly it's the same amount of energy and it can't get dispersed as sound. Does it actually heat the alarm up more? I mean, the energy has got to go somewhere, right? That's a good question. Uh, I guess it it would, but the amount of energy it takes to heat things, I think sound energy isn't that strong, right? So I don't like the oscillations in these pictures are very exaggerated. Like normally it's it, it's microscopic movements of air. I mean, to me, that's the amazing thing about hearing. Uh, but so I don't think it's going to like overheat something if you leave an alarm clock in a bell jar for too long. And I also think that it, I, I looked at demos for this to try to show a video, but you could still hear something and it was a little confusing. And I think it's because it's sitting on the table in the bell jar and probably transmitting through the bottom of the bell jar, right? So it's not going through the air, but it's still vibrating the base of the bell jar. So you might hear a little bit, but so it's probably also, yeah, there's stuff happening in other places. Um, Thank you. Yes. Okay. Um, all right, so, so the two big ideas to me about sound are they're waves, they vibrate stuff, and you need stuff to vibrate. So, okay. So how do we describe them? What are the properties? Uh, typically we talk about volume, right? So there's quiet and loud sounds, and we talk about pitch. Those are the words we use. So there's like low sounds and high sounds, right? And I think we all understand what those are. Um, but then how does that relate to sort of the more scientific ideas about what sound is? So the first I'll talk about volume. So volume has to do with the amplitude of the oscillation, right? Which probably isn't surprising that the, the larger the oscillation, the louder the sound would be in general, right? So a quiet sound, it's gonna be small, moving small amounts. Whereas like a loud sound is gonna be loud, big, big oscillations, right? There is another option to have a loud sound, which is having a bunch of stuff creating a sound. So if you have a lot of material, a lot of stuff moving, 
quietly, that's going to be loud as well as a big object. I mean, that's a lot of stuff too, but you, the, the size of things also helps. All right. Uh, and then pitch and frequency. So pitch is related to the frequency. I'm, I'm probably not telling you anything you didn't know, but I just want to make sure we all are in the same uh, wavelength. Ah, no, pun intended. Okay. So pitch uh, has to do with the, the, how many of these oscillations are happening at a given time. And if I had a slinky, the slinky, if I went back and forth just sort of slowly like this, that would be um, a low frequency. And if I went back and forth very quickly like this, that would be a high frequency. And in sound, the same thing. If the air is moving very slowly, it's what we hear as a low sound. And if it's moving very quickly, that's what you hear as a high sound. Um, so, and what, what happens, we see in general, larger objects tend to produce lower pitches, right? So if you think of, of the same kind of instrument, usually the bigger thing is the one that does the really low sounds and the tiny thing does the, low, the high sounds, right? So a string quartet or a brass quintet, or like the, I like think the didgeridoo, the big long one that, you know, lets out that big low thing, or the, the vuvuzela, right? The, those are really low sounds versus a little kazoo or something like that. All right, so I wanna do some demonstrations. Uh, well, we'll talk about some sounds here and tuning forks, so just to demonstrate that. So I have, I have some tuning forks here and uh, a set of them, but here's basically a tuning fork. And I'm, I, I recorded some sounds in case it's not easy to hear them over the speaker. So, We'll see how this goes, but I'm going to try playing one and see what you hear. Can anyone hear that? Oh, yeah. Oh, good, good. I wasn't sure. So, oh, wait, the first one, though, I have this little one, which is a, a thousand hertz tuning port. And this one, I think everyone can. Can you hear that? I can. Okay. How about others? If you can hear it, please type yes in the chat box. Okay. Yes, that's great. Thank you. I also had the recording here, so you can. That's the thousand hertz one. Lots yeah. of affirmations in the chat box. Okay, good. Thanks. Yeah, it's hard to see with the screen being shared. So, uh, and then that one I just played with two fifty six, right? That was this one. So that's that. And so this is how they compare, right? This is the 1000 Hertz one here, and this is the 256 Hertz one here. You can already see they're a little different. Um, then there's one that's 54 Hertz, so that's very low. So as you can guess, that gets considerably larger. That is here. So, whoa. yeah. Uh, oh, wait, so that, uh, I don't think it's easy to hear, but I'm going to try it anyway. I thought I would see what you can hear. So, but it, you, it's, it's a good visual though. So if I knock that, can you all see the tips vibrating? I don't know if you can see that. Like it's, but, and then I'll put it here near the microphone. Can you hear that? Only slightly. Yeah, if I get older, does that mean I won't hear it as much? Or? <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know if it depends on age because I don't know anybody young enough that I tested this on. So, <laughs> <laughs> right, but so our hearing actually goes out at about 20 hertz on average. So my guess is it probably is below some people. And I actually looked for sounds on YouTube that were 54 hertz and I couldn't hear them. So I, I, <laughs> I'm guessing it's just too hard to hear. But, but again, so the difference between the, the thousand hertz and the 54 hertz, so this is vibrating a thousand times a second when you get it going, and this only vibrates 54 times a second, right? And you can start to see it at that, at that uh, frequency because it's slow enough that our eyes can follow. We can't follow a thousand times a second. I do have one more for visual uh, monstrosity here. So this one, is even bigger. I don't even know how to get in the picture. So I'll stand back here. Can people see this? Yep, that's that's good. All right. So that one, you can't really hear it all, but certainly you can see that, I hope. 
Can people see the vibrations? I can. Please uh, affirm again in the chat box. I'm assuming it's folks have that. Great. Right, but this one you can't you can't really see you can't hear it, but you can certainly see what's going on, right? And so imagine the vibrations of that of the tines and the fork up there are moving the air around, and the air is now doing the same vibration moving out as we go across the room or wherever, and that's what ends up going to someone's ear. All right. How many hertz was that? Oh, I don't know. That's a good question. I don't think it's written on here. Oh, that. 9.7, so about 10. 10 hertz. It is written on there. Thanks for asking. I didn't even notice that. <laughs> All right. So, so uh, tuning forks are magical because they pretty much have that single frequency they produce. That's part of their, their, um, their utility and their purity is that they produce these single tones generally, although we'll see that's not entirely true. Um, but there are, so some of you, I'm assuming, have some musical background as well, and there are things called harmonics and overtones, right? So harmonics are multiples of some frequency. So like the one that was uh, 256 hertz, which I'm sure Luke likes that number, because it's a power of two. Yes. Yes, I do that. And uh, it, so a harmonic of that would be 512. And... 1,024, right? I'm getting there. Um, so those are multiples of the frequency. And why do I mention that? Because these things show up as uh, resonances when you have a fundamental, it's called a fundamental frequency, like 256. Sometimes you'll also hear these harmonics. And what's interesting about that is musically, our ears are tuned to things that are perfect ratios. So again, if you have some musical background, octaves, an octave up, so like going from a middle C to this next C above is a factor of two. The frequency is twice as large. And that sounds very nice to, to us. And a perfect fifth is a three to two ratio of frequencies. So that's really, uh, this is where music and science and math all sort of start to intertwine. And so harmonies in music tend to be made of harmonics, right? All these natural uh, ratios. So let me show this. So musical scales are based on this, right? So if you start with a note, uh, this picture has all these notes and they're all just multiple frequencies of the one all the way on the left. So the first one is if you double the frequency, you get an octave up. If you do three times the original frequency, that's a fifth above the next one, and then a fourth. And then it gets a little there's a couple tones that don't quite work in the system we have, and that's a whole different musical history thing that people argue about. And uh, uh, so <laughs> I'm not gonna get into that, but uh, that is, I think this is really cool that there's a bunch of math inside the music that has to do with the physics of how things make sounds too. So there's all sorts of intertwining here between art and science. Um, and I think that is, very cool. And in fact, mentioned astronomy is one of the original uh, seven uh, areas of study, right? So the, the, um, the music, all this harmonic ideas, when these came out, there are people who talk about the music of the spheres. And again, I'm not a historian of science. I'm going to mention this just briefly. But they, the idea, they, they had ideas about the ratios of the distances of planets from each other being almost perfect integers, and that couldn't be a coincidence and all of that kind of stuff. And, and so there's a lot of, uh, again, intertwining between early astronomy and these numbers and music. And so there was a lot of talk back and forth. And I think the idea when science was called natural philosophy for a long time, right? And I think this is where some of this, all this, it was all the same ideas just being applied to, you know, the experiments or the planets or musical instruments. And so it's kind of neat. And I think uh, as a historical piece, this is really interesting. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna go into that either because it's not my area of expertise. Maybe Sean Lotch could talk about that as a, in astronomy history. Uh, but so there was, there was a belief of this, these ratios being very important uh, for uh, astronomy as well. All right. All right, so 
we talked about all the basic ideas. I want to add a little complication to this, right? So most sounds we hear are not pure tones like a tuning fork, right? They're, they're very complicated sounds. There's very different components in them. And turns out they're made up of a bunch of frequencies. Often they're harmonic combinations, right? So if I hear a sound, uh, I'm going to talk about musical instruments mostly because it's fairly simple, but um, you will hear the bass note, the fundamental frequency. So like that tuning fork, say 256 hertz. If I played that note on a piano versus a violin or a trumpet, you'll hear it and you'll say, that's the same note, but it has a different characteristic. So we'll, I'm gonna break that down a little bit and show some of those ideas. All right, so here's, uh, there's, a, there's a program that um, I can, I don't think I actually have the, um, link to the program, but it's a, it's a sound analyzer. <clears throat> and you can download this and then play some sound and it will give you these two things, a frequency spectrum on the top, and then the, the signal that goes in your microphone is a waveform on the bottom. And it's, it's really great. Uh, and so I'm gonna show some of the sounds that I recorded myself here, and then I'm gonna steal other things from other places because I didn't have those things available. But um, so here is what an ideal version of like the 256 Hertz uh, tuning fork would be. And that's again, that's a middle C note. Um, and I have to just, if there are people who understand music more or musicians out there, this is, middle C in scientific pitch. So again, at some point in, I think the 1700s, there was a little uh, tussle scientifically about how to decide where to put concert pitch and like the, you know, what pitch to set. And people wanted to set a thousand Hertz as some particular note and everything else was multiples of that or divisions of that, right? Like I said, everything was integer multiples, right? So this is a really interesting sidebar. And um, uh, who was it? Sauveur, there's a name, Joseph Sauveur in France, wanted, he started at the 256, so he did powers of two. Again, Luke can appreciate this in particular, um, that uh, everything was just a power of two, so that you have 128, 256, 512, that would be the next C. Um, but it turned out concert people like the A440, to make 440 hertz the A, the concert tuning A, and so those, but those are not compatible. They're off by about five or six Hertz. And that's kind of important when you're, <laughs> if some people are tuning to one and some people are tuning to the other, that is not gonna sound okay. So uh, eventually the concert pitch one, which makes sense, they're the, they're the people playing the music. Um, but apparently there was a free for all for a while about where you tuned things to, and then people decided they needed standards. So, all right, enough of that, sorry. <laughs> the things you learn when you prepare all this stuff, right? So this is what a, a ideal tuning fork sound would look like. You only have that 256 Hertz and you have that lovely oscillating waveform. And that oscillation is sort of the, the microphone, the, the amplitude, the sound going into the microphone. So it is actually periodic and there's highs and lows uh, that the microphone is reading. Okay. What actually happens if I do this though, if I took the, the tuning fork and hit it and then put it in here is you don't get quite as pretty a thing and you get this spectrum of other stuff, right? So let me play the sound a minute. So notice, maybe I'll back that up again and do it one more time. I want you to listen to like all the different, the beginning and the end of that note. Okay, so you hear a really high tinny note right at the beginning and that's when I strike it, like there's that sort of high pitch note. And that's one of the ones over up in the, the um, that 256 times six, right? It's 1536 or even some of those higher ones. But they're multiples of, of the original note. So the, the 256 is there and then there's a 512 piece. And then there's this one times six. And you can see the waveform has other little waves on top of it, right? So that's what you're gonna get when you add waves together that are different, um, different frequencies and different amplitudes. Does that make sense? Any questions? I'm trying to connect the actual to the microphone signal and looking where peaks and valleys are. And I'm noticing that 
the peak of 256 is at actually a trough in the microphone signal. But then if you look oh, at oh, the... Oh. Sorry. Oh, if you look at the, the axes, they're different. The bottom one is time. Oh. Oh, well, hello. Uh, yeah, sorry, I didn't make, I didn't, I should have read those out. Thank you for pointing oh, that I out. I should have read my axes. I tell my students no, no. all the time. <laughs> okay, right, sorry. The top, the top is, is frequency spectrum. So that the, the X axis is the different frequencies that it is registering. So it is breaking apart the sound into different frequencies. I didn't, I didn't explain this enough. I'm sorry, I forgot to do that. And so, and the height of those, of the blue line is how, loud each of those frequencies is in the sound that it's hearing. Okay, and then the red line is just the actual sound waveform, if that makes sense. So the, the, if you didn't look at the top, if you only looked at the bottom, that's what we hear. Uh, and the top is breaking that sound out into individual frequency components and then putting it on a graph. Does that make sense? It does. Okay, does that help? I hope that helps other people too. I'm sure it does. So sorry about that, missing that piece. All right. Uh, yeah. So, so this is a little messier waveform that you hear. Yeah. The bottom is what we're hearing, and the top is what it's made up of. What sounds go into it, right? If I think about, you can almost think of the top as a bunch of tuning forks at different frequencies generating the sound with different amplitudes, right? Different amounts of each piece of sound. Okay. So uh, again, there's. I have a tuning fork here that's a, a 300 hertz one. That was the one. I mentioned before, so I'll make that sound. All right, so that one was a, a good one. Uh, that that had a little bit of a tinniness, so I don't. I must have done a little bit better sound on this one. Um, but again, you get a nice, a pretty waveform if you have just the pure tone at the at the three hundred ish hertz level. And again, the bottom is the sound, and that's time on the axis, and it's in milliseconds. So this is a a bunch of stuff happening all at once, like that's 25 milliseconds about in the in that whole axis, right? Which is one uh, fortieth of a second. So this is all happening many, many times per second. All right. And then if if you do it and you sort of aren't gentle about it and you get some clangy there, and that's what that sound you heard. Again, you can hear that really high pitch. Right, that sort of whininess, that's the 1.81 kilohertz. So that's 1810 hertz. So oscillating 1800 times a second. Uh, so part of the fork is doing that and part of the fork is doing some mode that allows it, you know, it's, it's just doing this where it's doing that and that's the 300 times a second. And I think there's a 600, there's a little bit of a 600 peak there. But if you see this, you see these oscillations in the bottom on top of the big oscillation, that's the 1800, right? There should be six of those in each of the other ones. Six of those little oscillations on top of the big one, if that makes sense. So I think that's a really cool picture. I'm really excited I got that one. Um, all right. All right, we're getting there. Uh, okay, and that's the 54 Hertz one. Uh, I managed to get a recording, but like, again, it's really hard to hear and you can barely get it. You see how small the signal is on the bottom. I'm curious if I can hear it. Yeah, no, you tried, right? You, I, I think I have another one. I, the next, yeah, so that's the 0.05. That's the 50-ish Hertz. And this thing doesn't have the sensitivity to tell me it's 0.054. So I'm going to call that good. So the next one though, I did it when I put the bass, like I tried to do with you all on the desk, it actually registered something. But if you notice, it's kind of a mess. Could you hear that? Let me play that again. Did you hear a rumbling? I did. Folks okay. in the chat window, did you guys hear the rumbling? I see some people nodding, so that's good. But that's only because I put it on a desk. And so now you see all those extra sounds came in from the desk, right? So the desk is, is helping to contribute to the, the 54 Hertz sound, but it's also creating some of its own sounds and, and that's muddying the note a little bit. But, you know, so we don't, we, we're not still hearing probably the 50 Hertz at that point. We're hearing something in the range of a hundred or so Hertz at that point, it sounds like, it looks like to me. All right. Uh, one more that I did, this is, oh yeah, that's the thousand. Hertz tuning fork, and I tuned up the, the, the app here so that it was a little more sensitive. And 
I got a nice, a nice crisp picture. So that's a thousand hertz line right there, right? And that was, that was this one. Yeah. I think you heard that. All right. And you can even see on this one that it's sort of decaying over time, like the, how loud it is, is fading away fairly quickly. Uh, all right, and when I did, I tried to whistle. I wanted to see how good a whistle was at like, so I just went and it turns out whistles are pretty good sound, right? They're pretty pure tones. Uh, so I thought that was a neat, a neat uh, sidebar there. All right, so those are nice musical sounds, right? So yeah, you can all go download this thing, the sound analyzer at some point, and then you can play to your heart's content. I have a quick question, John. Sure. On your last slide, on the bottom, the thousand hertz, it, you can see it damping down. Is that just changing the volume of it, or is the frequency changing as it goes along? No. Um, so the frequency is not changing. You could, I the 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 app has a a way to measure, and you can measure the time between oscillations. And I actually, for this one, it turned out it's funny you asked that for this one because I checked this and. On the left end, it was one millisecond, you know, a thousandth of a second between each peak, which makes sense because it's a thousand times per second. And I did it at the right end, and it was also the same thousand, one millisecond, right? So it shouldn't change because if it did change, you would hear the tone change too, right? And the idea is that this tuning fork, that's the natural frequency that it produces. So it shouldn't change unless you do something to the tuning fork. So one of the things people can do is like put weights on the top of it and it changes it because it changes the the properties of the metal and the fork and the size and shape affect the sound it makes. So I'm looking up here because that's where your picture is to me. <laughs> so yeah, so no, that's a great question, but it is, it should be the same the whole time. The fundamental frequency should stay the same so that that major oscillation should be the same. It should look the same the whole time. Well, that's interesting. I, I think that also comes into structures because I'm uh a structural designer. You have to know the natural frequency of the material you're working with sometimes. Yeah. Fatigue. Right, right. And, and actually, that's, that's an excellent point, right? That on the large scale, like sound waves, I should, I meant to point this out. Earthquakes are longitudinal waves. So everything that I'm talking about is applicable to sort of seismic events and wondering about buildings. And if a building ends up having a resonance at the frequency that earthquake waves pass through the ground, that's when you get in trouble because it resonates the building. So the building starts to sway at the, you know, whatever, but it's, those are very low. I think they're less than one per second, the oscillations that earthquakes do like to the ground. So, but a building can pick that up and suddenly it's swaying like crazy and that's what makes it fail, right? So uh, yeah, so a lot of the, the earthquake dampening is to change the, the resonant frequency of the, you know, to dampen those properties of the building itself by changing some of the mass or the, you know, the way it's built so that it doesn't have that structure. Yeah. Cool. Uh, all right, the whistle. And the whistle, the same thing, the freak, well, unless I changed my whistle as I did that, but I don't think it changed much, so. Okay, so let's look at a couple of these spectra for musical instruments, because I think these are really neat. Uh, so here's a saxophone. This is a different program because I didn't make these, I just stole them. Um, the right side is the time signature and the left is the frequency breakdown, right? And I'm gonna play the note. I think this one might be a little loud, right? So that's the saxophone playing whatever that note is, which seems like it's around 300. Yeah, there's about three per thousand there. So. So that's a saxophone. So take it, look at that. And then the next one is a trumpet, which you notice looks different, right? It doesn't peak at the bass frequency. It peaks somewhere later. And I think it's a really cool looking uh, sound wave. I think it's particularly attractive. And there's that note. And you can see that sort of sound, I mean, it's a higher note, but there's a lot more tinniness to it. And that's where you get the higher frequencies lead to that. And then a flute, which is a lot less complicated. Right, it's a simpler sound. Uh, and then the next one is a violin versus a flute. And these again are on a different uh, 
breakdown, a different look, but it's the same idea, right? The loudness is the top and the frequency is to the right. I don't have a wave form for the violin, but so these are playing the same note. So that's the violin and that's the flute. And it's a shorter note, but so these are the things that uh, characterize the different instruments, right? And, and you hear the, the higher frequencies in the violin contribute to the richness of the sound that we hear. Okay, let's see. One of the things that's coming up in the chat is oh, this yeah. connection to uh, sound and arts. Uh, John mentions that Eddie Van Halen loved harmonics. He said that they were everywhere. Uh, you know, he's yeah. ties into to the instruments here. Oh, here, now I can get the chat. I'll look at the chat in the corner here. Oh, Eddie Van Halen, yeah, it's true. Everything has uh, oh, how, okay, resonance and harmonics. Okay, I will talk about that. Yes, I'll talk about that in a second. I'll keep that in mind. Um, so yeah, before, let me go to one other piece and then we'll, I'll come back to the idea of resonance because I think that's actually in the next bit. Wrong. So how about non-musical sounds, right? I showed these things of instruments playing musical notes and, and we have these lovely spectra, right? So what about other things? So here is me snapping my fingers, right? It's, it's kind of a mess on both the bottom and the top there. There's no regular pattern. There's a little bit of a pattern, but I think that's like, right? When you snap, you almost can imagine that it plays a little bit of a note, but you have to really work at it to believe that, right? And so it's, if you look at that pattern on the bottom, you might say, yeah, there's a peak that's recurring re regularly, but you, there's a lot of other stuff in there that's messing it up. So. Uh, it's and it's spread across. I mean, it goes all the way up to eight kilohertz, right? And ten kilohertz here. I mean, it's mostly focused on the bottom. A clap, right? So that's just just me doing that, and I managed to catch it. And that's all over the spectrum. Again, nothing nothing regular or normal about that. Uh, and then one more is wrapping the knuckles on the desk. So just just doing that, right? Just tapping the desk and recording that sound. And that has a little different spectrum, but like if I go to the low numbers, right? This definitely sounded lower than the snap or the clap. And so there's a lot more stuff. And I would argue this, this, uh, this app is finding peaks, but I don't really think they're real. If I, they're not standing out a whole lot compared to other ones. So I think that's just the app looking for stuff that I, I don't really believe is there. It's sort of just a broad spread of, of sound. And this is sort of when you think about white noise, I don't know if that phrase, right, white noise, people have white noise machines sometimes, that just has a spectrum across, like it's, all frequencies are in that noise. And so that's what white noise is basically, so that there's no particular note that you're hearing. Uh, but this is what it all ends up looking like, right? So the difference, the big difference is that mus musical sounds and instruments have this set of harmonics and what I call impulsive sounds, things like claps or snaps, are, are broad across the whole set of frequencies with no particular pattern. And so that's a big difference in the way these two things operate. Um, but the one thing I'll say as a, uh, the impulsive sounds, right, since they contain every frequency, that's sort of why if I wanna start a tuning fork going, you can just hit it because in a sense, all those frequencies are contained in this little hit. And because the tuning fork is built to have a natural resonance at 256 Hertz, it picks up on that one frequency and, and runs with it, right? It's, that's where it, it resonates. So there's, that's, there's a lot more complications in there, but if you have a broad spectrum sound, you can start other things moving at multiple frequencies, right? So that's the idea there. Uh, all right, let's see. Oh, resonance, I have resonance right here. So I mentioned that, I said these tuning forks have what, they're called resonance frequencies. Resonant frequencies are the natural frequency that something will ring at, right? Like a bell or a tuning fork or a building, right? Um, we have, we have the graduated cylinders to, could be, right, when you blow over a bottle, 
And those also, of course, depend on size. So if I have a big one and a little one. Um, we have different frequencies there. Um, and you can also amplify by resonance. So one of the things we have in our department for doing this is a box that you attach the, uh, you attach the tuning fork to and the box is tuned so that when I strike this, striker, it'll make it much louder than it would by itself, right? So you can hear that sort of gong sound now. But that's because the air in, inside the box here is also resonating and oscillating at the right amplitude. So, all right. Um, so let me address slightly that question about resonance and harmonics. So the idea is if things are resonating, say at 256 Hertz, if they're oscillating at that frequency, there's, it's easy for them to oscillate twice as fast, to, for things to move twice as fast because you overlap with the same um, motion to some extent, or you have other modes they're called. So like a tuning fork normally just does this, right? That's the base mode, but there's another mode where it bends in the middle. So it's, I can't make my, my hands do that, but it does this on each time, right? So it's doing this and that's the one that's twice as high. And then there's other modes where you, it's flexing, you know, sort of three different flexes along the thing. And that's the three times as uh, high frequency. And so uh, it's the same with string, right? If you have string and you, you can make it one long oscillation, you can get it where there's a, a spot in the middle that's not moving. And so you get two this way, or you get three in the middle, right? The middle and the outsides are both going up and down and there's two nodes. Yeah, your sailboat used to vibrate when the diesel engine was at 2200 RPM. Right, yeah, cars do that, right? Sometimes you notice your car starts shimmying when it hits some frequency. And it's the same idea that the engine is resonating with the whole body of the car or something else in there. So again, that just, that, 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 uh, continues the argument that things have natural frequencies and you want to try to, we, we try to avoid having that happen in when we don't want it to happen. And we want it in certain other places. I would think as an engineer, you would try to engineer the structure so that the frequency it resonates at is not one that the motor can vibrate at, right? Because I'm yeah. assuming if you start resonating, things start shaking and shifting, screws start <laughs> loosening up, you right. know. Right, right. Water starts coming in the sailboat. <laughs> yeah. I'm pretty sure that's probably not supposed to happen. So, but again, like they could probably, uh, if you put something on the outside of the shell of the boat somewhere, it might help dampen things, right? You could put some foam somewhere. There's, there's ways you could probably change the structural properties of the boat to change what the natural frequency is, right? So you don't want the enemy picking up your signature. That's right. <laughs> Right. Actually, that's another thing, right? That, yeah, how you, how you dampen those kind of signals is another, it's the same idea. Some of it is the same idea. So, all right. Uh, I don't want to take too long here. Uh, I have a few more things and then I'll be done. Yeah. So, okay. Let me go back here. So I want to just to, to, to compound on all of this resonance idea and, and all the different modes that this, that, that why these sounds are so complicated, right? In a violin, at, at the simplest, it's a simple string that's just vibrating back and forth, right? Strings are the easiest physics thing we talk about in classes. And so a, a vibrating string with what's called a standing wave where the whole thing is just going like this up and down, right? That's the, that's the fundamental frequency of the string. But if I was just doing that, you wouldn't be able to hear it you know, a violin that you can hear in the back of a concert hall isn't just the string vibrating up and down, right? It's the string vibrating up and down and that vibration connected to the bridge of the, on the violin that connects to the body of the violin. And the body of the violin is built to have all these different modes that it, it resonates at and it amplifies some frequencies itself. The wood, and this is where all the magic of instrument making happens, right? The wood, the varnish, the shape, the holes, where those, where those, those F holes go. It's all, uh, that's again, a mixture of sort of art and science of like uh, trial and error and what sounds good to you. And so things are flexing 
and vibrating like, again, like one big oscillation or twisting, it's very complicated. So, uh, but people have done experiments. So the, these pictures are, people put um, like black powder on the violin body and then started vibrating it at different frequencies. And it, it ends up, the black powder goes where the violin body is not moving. So in between those black lines, it's doing something, but those places are staying put. So imagine this is what's sort of going on. And the black line is where it's not moving at all. The sand or whatever it is moves to those places. So these are different modes of the violin body moving. And because they're slightly different frequencies, they amplify different sounds that are coming in and also change the tone a little bit. So, so a violin is really, it, you have this simple string vibrating, which is the simplest physics ever and has some frequency spectrum because of the way the bowing works. But then the bridge has its own response to different sounds. And then the body has its own response to different sounds. And so you put all those three things together and you get a, a frequency spectrum that's very different from the simple string oscillating. And that's what gives the violin its characteristic sound. And all the other instruments have other things like that, that the material and the shape and, and the engineering and whatever that goes into it produce these sounds and have been have been tweaked and engineered over time. So I, I I think this is really to me really amazing that you know people have deconstructed how these things work, uh, and to think that you know 400 years ago this was purely empirical and just people tested stuff, right? So yeah. Okay. What is the uh, vertical and horizontal axis of the waveforms? The input and the output. Yes. Yeah, so those are the um, that's like what the microphone would be doing. Perfect, thank you. So it's time on the x-axis. Yeah, so that's right, time. And, and the input waveform is interesting there because the, the way the bow, it's a stick slip thing, right? So the bow grabs it, grabs the string and pulls it and then it snaps back. And then the bow grabs it again, which is why it has this sort of sawtooth look to it. So it's, that's a really interesting, Violins are really interesting. Like the physics of how a violin works is really cool. I could spend another 20 minutes on that. I'm not going to, you're welcome. But uh, yeah, so, so that's the basic idea. And then, yeah, so the, the, yeah, sorry, thank you. The input is the sound versus time and the output at the bottom is also versus time. But the left, the right side is all frequency responses. Okay, all right, last thing, because we talk about how all these sounds are produced, like what happens when it gets to our ears or how do we hear it, right? Uh, and this is just a couple minutes. Um, so we talked about how a tuning fork works. It vibrates the air. The air moves these longitudinal waves across the room and they get to your ear, right? So I also have to ask this question. I know people think about this, right? This is a big question people ask. <laughs> if a tree falls in the forest and no one's around, does it make a sound? So. Right, I guess I would argue the same goes with um, a tree falling as it does with a tuning fork, right? That you still have this, this longitudinal wave that's produced when the tree crashes on the ground. So if it reaches your ear, you hear it, but if, if there's no ear, that air is still vibrating, right? So in my opinion, sound is based on the physics part of it, not the hearing of it, right? So you don't have to hear a sound for there to be a sound. Just in case you are all gonna, you know, wondering about this. All right. We just put, uh, put a bunch of Buddhists out of work. Now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll try not to, to crush anyone else's philosophy today. So, um, all right. So I'm just going to end with a couple things about the ear because again, this is to me amazing. And there's, there's, of course, a lot of biology in there. But there's some basic physics that actually helps understand based on what I was hopefully telling you earlier here to, to go into this, right? So maybe people are familiar with the sound, the shape of the ear and the, the ideas in there, um, right? You have the ear canal to the eardrum, and then there's these bones that relay the eardrum vibrations into the inner ear. Uh, there are some very, very cool videos out there to, to look at. I, on the screens, when I'm showing you the next parts, I'm not gonna play the videos, but I'm going to show snapshots of them, but I have the links on the slide. So you can go look at them. I think they're pretty fascinating. Um, 
yeah, so this, the eardrum basically is receiving the sound, right? So uh, you're getting the air that's, that's oscillating back and forth goes into your ear and oscillates the eardrum. The eardrum just responds to whatever's happening in the air coming into the, the ear canal, right? So um, this is from a video and it's a picture. So the bottom left here is the eardrum and these are bones that when the eardrum oscillates, it oscillates the one bone and that causes this lever um, connection to oscillate that third bone, which is the one here in the, um, the one right up against the inner ear part here. And because the eardrum is large and this little bone is small, it, it actually amplifies the pressure. So the pressure and the, the sound coming into the eardrum gets amplified, I think about 20 times going into the ear canal. Because again, remember I said, it's very small oscillations. It's teeny tiny oscillations of the air. And so this amplifies it. And then there's inside the ear canal, inside the inner ear, that's the cochlea. So that rolled up thing is the cochlea. And that's named like a snail, right? But if you unroll it, there's this, it's filled with fluid and then there's a membrane in there, in the, in the fluid that has, um, so there's a membrane that is then connected to hair cells that go to nerve cells that go to your, to your brain. And what it turns out is that the, the membrane itself, the basilar membrane has, is built so that at different points along it, it resonates at different frequencies. Right? So it's the same idea we just talked about, but backwards. So your ear is basically deconstructing the sounds it hears. And at the left end here where it says 16 kilohertz, that part is, even, it's smaller, which is counterintuitive, but it's actually much stiffer material there. And at the right end where it's the low frequencies are received way up in the top, it's, it's actually floppier. And so it's easier to it respond to the lower frequencies. So that's sort of counterintuitive to the other thing I said that small things are high frequency and large things are low frequency, but it's because the material itself, it's stiffer at one end and, and smushier at the other end. But it does the same thing where it breaks apart the sound um, into different components. And then those nerve cells get oscillating and then, or the hair cells oscillate and then they send a signal to the ear. And all this happens in, you know, microseconds. This is the, the part when I, I think about all this stuff and I think how quickly our brain has to process all of this and it's amazing to me. So um, yeah, these are the two different videos you can look at to see these things. Uh, and I am gonna play this one piece cause this is pretty cool. Well, actually I won't do that cause I think there's time. Um, this is a video from Howard Hughes Medical Institute. And the, at the end, they unroll this and then he plays the Bach Toccata and Fugue, you know, the da -da -da, da -da -da. And this is at one point saying, showing how the different places along the basilar membrane would respond to those notes. So it's fun to watch. And the scientist at the end is, is all gushy about how this happens. So. Uh, and we can get there from that link on the bottom. Yes, the link on the bottom is the link to this uh, video. So Perfect. yeah, okay. Last one, this is the last slide, sorry. Um, and so the last piece is like, we hear stuff. Oh, I meant to build this up, I'm sorry. I didn't animate this enough, it's a little busy. Um, we, we hear stuff, uh, I've talked about the physics, the, the actual intensity and the pressure, the amplitudes of how, how big something is vibrating and the frequency at which it's vibrating, right? But then there's the perception and what do we hear? So it turns out, we respond to different frequencies with different uh, sensitivity. So let me explain this, one of these graphs. So follow one of those brownish lines, right? The bottom, the right axis, the X axis is a frequency. So at the left is low frequency sounds and the right is very high frequency sounds. And on the Y axis is like how the amplitude of the sound. So a loud sound or a quiet sound or a loud amplitude each of these brown lines is what a person would say is the same loudness. And each of those lines is a different level of loudness. So I picked the one in the middle where it says 45 phons, P-H-O-N-S is the unit of perceived loudness. People make these units up, it's pretty impressive. Um, 
But so the idea is that red dot is at 3,500 Hertz and the blue dot at 90 Hertz is a louder sound. So I didn't talk about decibels, but those are how we measure the intensity of a sound objectively. So not how we hear it, but how it's objectively uh, created. And it's a louder sound at 90 Hertz for us to say it's the same loudness as a sound at 3,500 Hertz. Does that make sense? So we are, it's easier for us to hear things where there's that dip in the, in the brown line. So things that are lower on a brown line don't have to be as loud for us to say it's the same loudness. I I'm find, sure that makes sense. Uh, this is uh, Luke again. I find it weird that you can have an objective fawn. I feel like a 45 fawn for you and a 45 fawn for me could be. Yeah, I, I think they're averaging a lot of people. I don't know if there's like, if it's fuzzy, but this is also, they had to do this with people. Like this is actual people right. who had to say, they, I think they what they do is they go to a hundred Hertz or a thousand Hertz and then they say, here's a sound, it's this loud. And then they pick a different frequency and they say, is this, this tell me when this is as loud. And then they mark it, right? Right. And, and I don't know how they, I'm not sure about the fonts itself, right? But so uh, the only thing I wanna mention about this is that I think is cool is the dip at 3,500 Hertz. So we are really good at hearing things around 3,500 Hertz. That is directly related to the shape of our ear canal. So it's a resonance of that little bit of ear between the outer ear and the eardrum. And so we have a little bit better hearing at that frequency. And I don't know, probably evolutionarily, it helped us with something. You know, maybe that's the sound of a branch breaking when there's a, a monster, you know, an animal coming to get you or something. I don't know. But, um, and, and so that's, I thought was kind of a neat piece to, to note. All right. I think that is it. I think I've probably overspent my time and uh, filled you all up. <laughs> so, Thank you very Thank you much. Very much for the, the presentation. And I would open it up if there are um, questions from uh, our audience members. And of course, you can put um, comments in the chat window and we can grab them there. So, well, actually, I was wondering about that 3,500. Somewhere in the back of my head, I can't remember where, but it, I was told that it, uh, the reason we hear best at that level is because of human speech. But I don't know that that's necessarily true because some people have very deep voices and other people have high voices. Right. So that's a good point. 30, I mean, 3,500, right? This, this little, the, the thousand Hertz, right? Was pretty high. So 3,500 is kind of above what we normally hear. Uh, speaking frequencies, it turns out when you speak, again, the spectrum of our speaking voice, I mean, everyone's a little different, but there are, harmonics, right? There are harmonic frequencies and there are other frequencies to do with the shape of your mouth and your throat and resonances in your mouth. Like even when you say ooh versus ah at the same note, you get a different spectrum, which is really cool. Uh, but so I, yeah, 3,500 is really high. I didn't, I didn't look into that enough, but I mean, what I read was it has to do with the shape of the ear canal. But again, that's probably evolved for some purpose. Well, maybe it's so I could hear my wife. <laughs> oh, she didn't like that. I, I can't imagine why not. <laughs> I was wondering if there was a certain resonance that your wife was at. That's why I don't hear it, you know. <laughs> I cannot endorse uh, any of this scientifically, I have to say. <laughs> other uh, questions are our, our uh, lodge musician points out that a male chorus will sound will work together and sound good no matter what how badly they sing individually <laughs> where a women's chorus their their voices are far enough pitched they can don't necessarily get a, an even sound interesting yeah i don't that that's a i mean some of that might be there's a number of reasons that could be explained or yeah. but yeah there might be that the lower frequencies dominating in the male voices has a different you know the way we hear things could be different uh -huh. So, yeah. Other questions? 
All right. Well, thank you so much, Professor Thompson, for, uh, for the presentation. I think that was wonderful. So. Thank you very much. Uh, you'll probably see a lot of clapping and not hear any because that's all right. I, I'm used to that. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Um, next up. I'd like to uh, introduce our, our next speaker. Um, but before I do, I actually want to make sure that I thank um, Don McDougall, who helped organize both of these speakers coming here today. Um, and so thank you, Don, for, for putting this together because we're going from the, uh, the physics and the mechanics of sound and how sound works to how that can be applied in helping our, our fellow human beings. And so, with that as segue, I would like to talk a little bit about Brian Harris, who is our next speaker. He is the co-founder and CEO at MedRhythms, uh, which is a company that helps with neuroscience and digital therapeutics and the use of music, which is fascinating work. So Brian is a passionate and motivated leader and an entrepreneur who strives to make the world a better place by helping others. And he's demonstrated these uh, qualities by building a world-class digital therapeutics company that we're going to hear about today and the work that they do in developing the arts and neuroscience group at the American Congress of Rehabilitation Medicine. Um, he's one of only 350 individuals in the world uh, with advanced training in the clinical application of the neuroscience of music. And so I'm very excited to uh, hear his presentation today uh, of the work that he is doing and that MedRhythms is doing uh, to use sound to make a difference in people's lives. So without further ado, I would like to hand it over to Brian Harris. And Brian, thank you for joining us today. And we look forward to your talk. Well, thank you so much for having me. And John, that was a fantastic presentation. So thank you for uh, setting the foundation uh, for, I think this actually flows pretty well because from here, I'm gonna talk, that, you know, the physics of sound is not my forte uh, at, at all. And from here, I'm gonna talk about, well, what happens to our brains once the sound enters our ear? So that was a good, I think, segue uh, into this presentation. But thank you, John, for that. That was that was wonderful. Um, and uh, thank you all for being here today and for having me. Anytime I get an opportunity to share this work that we're doing in music and neuroscience and that met with them, it's always an honor. And so I appreciate you taking the time to be here to to hear it. And you know, specifically through the Maine Masonic College is also uh, a meaningful event for me as uh, I am myself uh, also a Mason. Um, I was raised in Piscataquis Lodge in uh, number 44 in Milo, but also uh, am a member at Mechanics Lodge number 66 in Orono and Triangle Lodge number one now in Portland. So it's been a big part of my life uh, thus far in uh, an organization that has given me much. And so it's an honor to be able to, to give something back uh, to it once in a while. So I very appreciate the opportunity to be here. And it's also great to see that we have some international uh, uh, brothers here as well, which is a bit ironic too, because uh, as I uh, saw them being introduced, one in India and one in, in Greece, um, Greece was actually my very first international trip that I took um, doing music therapy. And I had the, uh, the wonderful honor of uh, spending um, uh, seven days in Athens uh, treating patients in hospitals there using music therapy. And it was a very profound experience. Um, and then just three years ago, I, I guess we are coming up on three years now, um, I was invited to go to Mumbai to deliver two back-to-back uh, -back days of lectures on music and neuroscience with a colleague of mine invited by the Neurology Foundation of India. And it was just a, an incredible uh, experience for me. And I really fell in love with, uh, with Indian culture and the food uh, and everything there. So it's wonderful to have you here. And it's a, sort of a nice full circle uh, to come back to. But, but thank you again for, for having me. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen uh, now as well. If you see me looking back and forth, I have uh, two screens set up here. So that's, uh, that's a bit uh, of the reason why. Um, and you should, I think, be able to see my screen. Um, you, can, can you, you can see the PowerPoint, not the yes. presenter view, right? Correct. Excellent. So we are, we should be, well, we should be, uh, then I'm gonna actually just do this. Great, so you can see this now? Yes. Okay, excellent. So uh, as, uh, as uh, he mentioned uh, as the introduction here, so I'm a board certified music therapist by training um, and I have advanced training in the neuroscience of music and how that can be clinically applied to help people recover from neurologic injury and disease. 
to things like uh, stroke, traumatic brain injury, Parkinson's disease, MS, et cetera. Um, I started my career at Spalding Rehabilitation Hospital in Boston, which is the Harvard Medical School affiliate for neuro rehab hospitals. And uh, it's currently ranked the number two rehab hospital in the US. Um, and I was their first music therapist and built their program primarily treating uh, brain injuries and strokes. And we were finding that uh, patients were getting better faster with greater results. And we now had the neuroscience to not only explain how these results were possible, but also how we standardize and replicate these results to help people improve things like movement and language and cognition. And very quickly after starting that program, um, you know, the demand for my services, both from physicians who were actually writing orders for me to see their patients in the hospital, but also from patients and their family members who were saying, you know, Brian, you helped my dad walk again. How do I get more of this when I leave the hospital? And at the time, you know, the answer really was there's nothing that you can do. And that was an awful conversation for me to have with patients and their family members on a regular basis, because as you may be aware, there's not many music therapists trained in the world specifically through this lens of neuroscience. And so that was really the foundation of MedRhythms is we started the company to figure out how do we answer that question? So how do we bring this important work through music and neuroscience to people around the world who we believe not only need it, but deserve to have this level of care? And so that's sort of my background sort of where I'm coming from today. And the answer to that is uh, sort of through high uh, quality clinical care, but also through technology. And so today I'm gonna to talk sort of at a high level and give you enough foundation through neuroscience research to talk about how music can actually be applied to help people improve things like movement. So walking and arm movement, speech and language um, and cognition. So attention, memory, et cetera. But it all starts with this idea that music has power. And I think that that's something that we can all agree upon, that music has power. And when we think about the, this question of what kind of power does music have? And this is a question that I ask uh, at the beginning of all of my presentations. Typically, um, you know, the, the answers that get shouted back at me when I ask this question of what kind of power does music have? People say things like, well, uh, it calms me down or it gives me energy. Um, you know, it, it helps me uh, to uh, feel certain feelings, to modulate emotions. Um, also, we know that music has the power to speak things when words can't, right? That's what we call the social science power of music, meaning that's how music makes us feel. What I'm gonna talk about today is transitioning that lens from a social science to purely a neuroscience perspective. So thinking about how can music impact the human brain objectively through the lens of neuroscience. And everything that I'm about to tell you today um, is applicable to 97% of the human population. So regardless of age, culture, ability, or disability, everybody's brain responds the same to music. It's really, it's really incredible. And the advancements of neuroscience and neuroimaging research has shown us a way that we can now look at music through neuroscience. And I'm trained in what's called neurologic music therapy, as I mentioned, which is really the focus of taking uh, the neuroscience research of music to how it can impact non-musical function. So this work is not for musicians. It's not to improve musical function. It's actually to improve non-musical function. So things like movement, language, and cognition due to any sort of injury or disease to the human nervous system. So stroke, TBI, autism, Alzheimer's, Huntington's disease, Parkinson's disease, et cetera. There's only about 1500 uh, neurologic music therapists in the world, but it's a really exciting time to be doing uh, this work. And what's really interesting is um, I'm involved uh, at, at the American Congress of Rehab Medicine. And uh, a few years ago, a, a keynote speaker said that on average, from the time that something is discovered in healthcare until it begins to be implemented, so not globally implemented, but until it begins to be implemented by early adopters, on average is 17 years. I'm gonna pause and let that one sink in for a minute. So from the time we understand that something works until we begin to be implemented on average is 17 years. Well, what's interesting about that is that that 17 year mark, that's typically when the early adopters start um, to take on uh, this new thing and then it spreads from there. Neurologic music therapy was started uh, as an established healthcare profession in 1999. So we're about 22 years into the profession. And what we saw was that exact same sort of growth curve about five years ago with the expansion of um, 
uh, research being done at healthcare institutions and education institutions around the world, um, we saw about five to 10 years ago was actually the point at which the early adopters, which we call the top rehabilitation hospitals in the country, started to use neurologic music therapists. And we've seen sort of a, an exponential growth in the field from there. And these are 20 standardized interventions that we use. So we oftentimes think about music as a subjective experience, but these are actually objective um, interventions that uh, are implemented by neurologic music therapists. I'm not gonna talk about all of them today, but just show you the breadth of interventions across movement, language, and cognition. And so this really comes down, these are the high level principles behind this work. And what we've shown in neuroimaging and neuroscience research is that um, there's two primary principles that underlie all of this work. The principle of global activation and the principle of neuroplasticity. And what this means is that the research has shown that um, when we passively listen to music in our environment that we like, that it engages the parts or activates the parts of our brain that are responsible for movement, language, attention, memory, emotion, executive function. And there's actually no other stimulus on earth that engages our brain as globally as music does. It's also been shown that engaging in music, so this could be learning a new instrument, this could be singing uh, in a choir or even in the car or in the shower or wherever you might sing, that just the process of engaging in music or the interventions that we do at, as clinicians, that, that process of engaging in music aids in the process of neuroplasticity. So neuroplasticity being your brain's ability to strengthen old connections throughout your entire life that's actually the reason why we can learn new things as we age is because your brain can strengthen old connections or creating new connections in the brain, which is why people who have things like traumatic brain injuries and strokes can recover is because your brain can continuously move and, and to create these new connections. And it's been shown that engaging in music aids in that process of neuroplasticity. So when we think about how it globally activates like nothing else on earth, and it can aid in the process of the brain literally healing itself, that gives us an enormous new way to help people in a novel way. And I always like to show this slide uh, that I titled the mechanism of action. And the mechanism of action for those aren't, who aren't aware, this is a sort of a term of art that's used in the pharmaceutical industry to explain how drugs uh, impact the brain or how drugs impact the body to show an outcome. They explain it through a mechanism of action. We now have such a, a, an understanding of the neuroscience of music that we can explain it via a mechanism of action. And that's important because we are actually getting drug-like outcomes with the intervention that we're doing, interventions that we're doing, and that actually helps us to uh, advocate and to spread the knowledge is when we can speak in these terms. And so I'm gonna break this down into sort of three primary sections. So music and movement, music and language, and music and cognition. And obviously with just you know 40 minutes or so here, this is going to be a, a pretty uh, quick, but I'm gonna to try to keep it high level, but substantive enough that you, you walk away with some tangible points here. Uh, quick question, Mr. Harris. Yeah. Is music engagement learning to play music or listening to music? It was a question from- uh, Yeah. So what the research supports is that there is some value in music listening. However, when we talk about neuroplasticity, that's actually the engagement in music. So engagement in music doesn't necessarily mean literally learning an instrument. It could be um, walking to music. So actually some sort of uh, engagement outside of passive listening, or it could be cognitive engagement too, and we'll talk about that in a bit, but it's um, some sort of active engagement versus just a passive listening. Thank you. You're welcome. And so, how uh, music can be used to improve uh, movement outcomes really comes down to the power of rhythm. And I'm going to show you this video. And this is a man who has Parkinson's disease. And you're going to notice that he has what we would consider a, a, a fairly typical presentation of Parkinsonian gait or Parkinsonian walking, where he takes very short steps. Um, he has what's called freezing of gait. So you'll notice that as he's walking, he will just randomly stop sometimes and he sort of gets stuck. Turning is also very difficult. It's also a difficult thing to, to, have, to do is, is turning. Initiating movement is difficult. So in Parkinsonism, it's a loss of the automaticity of movement. And so in this video, what you're going to see is this man walking across his living room um, with, with, in silence. And you're going to notice these, uh, these presentations. And then he's going to walk back towards the camera and he's going to turn on music. 
and you're going to see the immediate impacts of how rhythm changes his movement. So I'll point out again here the very small steps. You notice this is a freezing episode where he actually gets stuck. He sits down. He's gonna come back and walk towards the camera again with those steps. Also for people with Parkinson's, it's very difficult to walk backwards. Here he has another freezing of gait episode. And he's gonna go over to his right and he's going to turn on uh, music that has a strong beat salience or a strong beat strength. And he's gonna try to walk or move to it. And you're gonna see the immediate impacts of what that rhythm does. So already his steps are longer. Turning doesn't seem to be so difficult. Walking backwards also not so difficult. And the reason that this happens is through a process that's called uh, auditory motor entrainment. Don't worry about the, the neuroscience here. This is just a neuroscience that, that uh, is the foundation behind it. But what the research shows is that when we hear a rhythm that is consistent, um, um, uh, auditory and rhythmic in nature, so it has this, a, a, a consistent temporal cue, that it engages our auditory system because it's an auditory cue. But the, re the neuroscience research shows that the auditory system and the motor system are subconsciously connected via the reticulospinal tract, such that when we hear an external auditory cue that's rhythmic in nature, it actually engages the motor system and the auditory system at, in synchrony. And the auditory and motor system begin to fire at a subconscious level in synchrony with that external auditory cue. And that's what we call auditory motor entrainment. Now, this is applicable to people who have damage to the motor system, but also to healthy individuals. I typically do, uh, in all of the presentations that I've ever given about this topic, um, I typically grab somebody out of, the, uh, out of the audience and do a live demonstration of the power of rhythm on movement, where I have somebody walk to the beat of music, and then I have them to try to not walk to the beat of the music. And it's almost impossible for humans to not walk to the beat of the music because the uh, rhythm is literally giving the brain a signal to tell the body to move subconsciously. And in order to not walk to the beat of the music, we actually have to cognitively uh, 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 piece out the um, information or piece out the music that we hear or the rhythm that we hear in our environment. And if you ever want to try uh, a fun trick, and I tell people this in the Zoom world that I can't demonstrate this live, but if you download a metronome app, so an, an app that just keeps time on your phone, and you go to a park on a sunny day, hook it up to a speaker and set it to about 105 beats per minute, which is about the average walking cadence of an adult. And you just let it play. What you'll notice is that as people come within earshot of that metronome, they will synchronize their steps to the metronome. And as they leave earshot, they will desynchronize their steps to the metronome, even if they're in conversations with other people, because the, the rhythm is literally telling their brain to tell their body to move in time. And that's called entrainment. And entrainment is really the fundamental approach or the foundation by which we can improve clinical outcomes because it also happens for people who have damage to the motor system. And so this is a boy who's about two years old and I'll just show this to you. Incredible. And when we show this video, I always like to show this video because I think, well, every good presentation about music needs a baby video. So you're welcome. There you go. There's your baby video. And while it's adorable, what's really magnificent about this is when we think about how this happens, 
Um, so we think about the elements of music being uh, melody, harmony, and rhythm at a high level. When we think about melody, that's easily defined. It's a sequence of notes, right? We think about harmony, it's two or more notes in relation to one another at a high level. And when we think about rhythm, I can certainly explain to you what rhythm does. But how would you know or how would you teach a baby that's two years old to play along with music or to entrain to the rhythm of music? I can certainly teach him how to hold the sticks and which drums to hit, but how do you get him to play in time with the music? And what the research shows is that that's actually not something that's taught. It's something that is ingrained in human beings that we're born with, this natural synchronization to an external cue. It's actually been shown that babies in the third trimester have the ability to respond to music. So it's literally one of the first things that we gain as human beings. And so more recently, auditory motor entrainment has been used as the foundation of a standardized clinical intervention called rhythmic auditory stimulation. So this is using entrainment applied to neurologic disease or injury. And it's been shown that rhythmic auditory stimulation can improve outcomes. Things like improving walking speed, stride length, cadence, balance, and even to be able to reduce falls. Um, and so I'm gonna show you a video of this. So this is actually a video of me delivering rhythmic auditory stimulation to a stroke survivor at Spalding Rehab Hospital in Boston. He had a, a stroke in the cerebellum and he has a typical, what we would consider to be a typical presentation. So he has a, a hemiparesis, uh, meaning his right side does not take the same size steps as his left side. You'll notice very short steps that he's taking, very slowly walking and um, a strong asymmetry. The beginning of this video that I'm going to show you is after he's had three weeks of physical therapy, five or six days a week for an hour a day. So somewhere between 15 and 20 sessions of physical therapy. The rest of the video that you're going to see after this initial clip is one 45 minute um, session doing rhythmic auditory stimulation. So you'll notice walking with a cane, very short strides, walking very slowly. His right side is uh, asymmetrical, so it's not taking the same size step as his left side. And so with rhythmic auditory stimulation, we look at all of those baseline parameters and then we start the beat of the music at the tempo that the person is walking. In this case, it was 65 steps per music. So we start the music at 65 beats per, per minute. Uh, so to see if they can entrain and if their quality of gait is good. So I'm using very simple music. And you'll notice that he's able to walk to the beat of the music and his symmetry gets a little bit better. It's not great, but it does get a little bit better. So then the protocol is to speed the tempo of the music up by 5% of what you want. And you notice that he's able to do well there. So then we thought, well, what if we take the cane away? Um, and that's important because he's using a cane for balance and not for weakness, which is important because if somebody's using a cane for weakness, we're never going to take the cane away because they'll fall down. But if they're using a cane for balance, we know that as human beings, as evolutionarily, we're made as bipedal beings, meaning we're made to shift our weight between two points rather than three. And we see in the hospital all the time that even though patients need them, to teach a patient to walk with a cane or with a walker is oftentimes very awkward. So we said, well, let's see if we can take the cane away and get him to entrain without a cane. And this is his first time walking post-stroke without a cane. We see that he's able to walk very well in time. So then per the protocol, we speed the tempo of the music up by 5% of that baseline tempo. Arm swing naturally comes back. Symmetry is looking better. Stride length is looking better. So then we continue to speed it up over the course of the session. So 
So significant improvements, but then here's the important part. At the end of the session, we take the music away because we care about non-musical function. So you want to see how does he walk without the music now? And so just for context, here's the beginning after three weeks of physical therapy, five days a week for an hour a day. And this is 45 minutes later. And these are results that we were seeing replicated in the hospital with patient after patient. And it became this sort of driving question to me to say, well, if we can explain this through neuroscience and it can be replicated, why doesn't every single person on earth have access to this care when they have a neurologic injury or disease. And that's really was the foundation of my career to figure out how do we answer that question. Mr. Harris, quick question for you. Yes. Um, obviously that was after how many hours again of physical therapy roughly? He was at? About seven, well, 15 to 20, but it was- 15 three. to 20. What is it like for someone who hasn't had 15 to 20 hours of physical therapy do they have the same type of response to the auditory uh, stimulation as somebody who has had the 15 to 20 hours or are the 15 to 20 hours kind of a prereq for, for that person to get that type of response to the rhythmic, uh, rhythmic auditory stimulation? It's a great question. And we actually see that there's no correlation there. So the, the pre-physical therapy, I mean, as long as somebody can stand and initiate movement, on their own, that's when we can start the, uh, the uh, intervention, but there is no foundation of physical therapy needed to uh, respond to the treatment. Also, what we're seeing as well is that there's no uh, uh, time sense injury that is too far to uh, respond to the intervention as well, because we now know that there's no point at life in which neuroplasticity stops. So even people who are years post-injury can respond to this as well, even if they had physical therapy or rehabilitation 10 years ago. How does, just quick, oh, go ahead. How does attitude play into it, Brian? I, I love the question. How does attitude play into it? You know, I think that with any sort of intervention that requires an active engagement, you must be willing, right? So there must be a, a, a point at which you're willing to engage and, you know, without being cliche, but to trust the process. What we have found actually in, in our treatment is one, because we use music, and uh, I'll talk a little bit more about this in a moment, but we use user preferred music in, in most situations outside of this one scenario that you saw here, it's usually engaging and motivating for patients to do it. What we also find is that after a patient does one session and they see the responses that they have to it, that usually serves as sort of a, sort of a, a spark to get them to engage more and to be motivated by the work. Uh, quick clarifying question on the neuroplasticity comment. Um, so the neuroplasticity of like a toddler and the neuroplasticity of a 90 year old, they must at least be somewhat different. Maybe it doesn't go away completely or are they the same between a toddler and a 90 year old? They are absolutely not the same between a toddler and a, and a 90 year old. So the neuroplasticity of a toddler, I mean, they're, they're synapsing like crazy, just fireworks in their head all the time. As you age, neuroplasticity slows but it never stops. So what we talk about is, what we would expect is that the farther post-injury you are and the, the uh, age has some to do with that, um, we would think about what the potential of, of full recovery looks like. So you know, we may say that the farther from injury, your trajectory may not get you to here, but it will get you to here. So it's more about uh, making clear about expectations but some benefit is possible regardless of age or time post-injury. Thank you very much for the clarification. Of course. And so here's just a, a bit of the research. So this is this, uh, I showed you this in stroke, but this has been studied in cerebral palsy, MS, Parkinson's disease, aging. In fact, it has been shown across the disease states to be able to improve functional outcomes, as, as I mentioned. Um, and this is actually an interesting study that we did at MedRhythms um, with a, a, our digital therapeutics. So this is actually a product that we built, which I'm not going to talk a lot about today, but we built a product to replicate rhythmic auditory stimulation through sensors and algorithms, which you just, uh, that intervention that you just saw me doing, but without the need of a clinician present. And what we showed was that patients who were uh, in the chronic stroke phase, so these are people who are at least 
six months post stroke. Um, that with our product doing rhythmic auditory stimulation that they had on average about a 10 to 15% improvement of gait speed from day one to day four, which is about two weeks over two week period. So they get about a 10 to 15% improvement in gait speed. What is fascinating about this is that uh, the, we had one, what we would consider to be a super responder. So one subject in our study who had just a, an incredible response to the intervention and she was 20 years post stroke. And as a clinician, that is just remarkable to think about that you could be 20 years post an injury and be functioning in a certain way for 20 years and within two weeks change that because of the intervention. But we know that that's possible because the music is engaging the brain in a novel way to create those new connections. But what we also looked at was we looked at walking economy which is a measure of walking efficiency. It's measured by oxygen consumption while you walk. So. Uh, essentially, you want to use less oxygen or use less energy as you walk, meaning that you also consume less oxygen as you're walking. And what we showed was that people not only were walking faster who had stroke deficits, but they also were walking 15% more efficiently than when they weren't using the product. Walking economy or walking efficiency has implications to endurance, so how far and how, people, how fast people can walk. So if you think about if you're walking more efficiently, you can walk farther distances or for longer periods of time. So a very compelling outcome. Two, uh, two questions here. One in the chat window about does a metronome work as well as music? Uh, great question. So as we think about outcomes related to rhythmic auditory stimulation, there are objective parameters that are necessary and there are subjective parameters that are necessary. So objective parameters that are necessary is we need a consistent rhythm in a certain time signature that doesn't change over time. So a metronome checks that box. So at a base level, you can do rhythmic auditory stimulation with a metronome. What they then studied is that your brain functionally responds better to emotionally salient information, essentially to music that you like. And they've actually shown that familiar music, when you can do rhythmic auditory stimulation to familiar music, it enhances the functional outcomes. So. What we now, and that was early studies. So what we know is that you need the rhythm. It can be done with a metronome. Looks like music enhances the outcomes by a bit. The second question was on the graph in the outcome of walking economy. Um, it looks like all data points, um, pre-training to post-training, almost all have this uh, average reduction in um, oxygen consumption but there's this one person who seemed to have an increase in their oxygen consumption. Is there, is there a story behind that anomaly? Yes, so there's two ways that that could be explained. One is um, based upon what their deficit is. So if somebody does not have a baseline deficit in walking economy, we would expect actually by virtue of them walking faster that they may show an increase here. So let's uh, assume that uh, all of these other folks here that their original deficit. So you'll notice here, um, so without getting too different, this is the milliliters of oxygen per kilograms per meter walked. It's essentially like um, the analogy is like miles per hour, uh, not miles per hour, miles per gallon in a car. So it's essentially how much oxygen you use for the distance that you walk based upon your weight, if that makes sense. So th these folks at baseline here pre-training had a much higher cost, energy cost of walking to begin with. If you notice this person here really had a very low cost, energy cost of walking to begin with. So we wouldn't expect much change there. And in fact, we could potentially see an improve or an increase in that. The other thing that could, so that's one hypothesis here. Um, is it, the other hypothesis is based upon biomechanically how people walk. So if you imagine that you have one side that's hemiparetic. So one side doesn't move the same size steps as the left side. It takes a lot of energy to move that hemiparetic side forward. If somebody was by virtue, and what we know is that with rhythmic auditory stimulation, the principle is that we're improving speed, but we're also improving quality. So we're improving actually the, the symmetry or the stride length of the person as well. If a person doesn't improve their symmetry, so they don't improve their quality, they just take faster steps, but still with a lot of energy to move that, that 
uh, hemiparetic side forward, we would also expect the walking economy to go up as well. So I don't know about the biomechanics of that subject, but looking at this, what I would suggest is that it's likely more due to that they didn't have much of a deficit in um, walking economy prior to the training. Therefore, the walking faster actually had a perhaps uh, inverse correlation. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, and so this is some, uh, some uh, 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 research here and actually neuroimaging of neuroplasticity. So what they actually showed was, um, so this part, this red part here is called the arcuate fasciculus. We're going to talk about this later. But arcuate fasciculus has um, an, uh, a, a place in motor planning. And what they showed is that music cued movements, so when you actually do movements to, um, to music, that it actually changed white matter pathway. So it actually changed the thickness of the arcuate fasciculus from pre to post training versus not doing um, exercises uh, to, to music. So actually showing neuroimaging evidence of neuroplasticity. So engaging in the music literally changed the fiber track pathways in the brain. Quick, quick question on that last slide. Yep. Is, you'll have to refresh my memory on this. Is the arcuate uh, fasciculus part of the medial forebrain bundle? Because it looks like it's the same part that connects the two hemispheres. Well, so it's interesting. So the arcuate fasciculus, yes, because the arcuate fasciculus here also is, um, it's more responsible for language. So we're going to talk about that in a moment, but it connects Wernicke's and, and Broca's areas, which are sort of ipsilateral, but across uh, from each other as well. So yes, to your answer, it's interesting that we saw um, we saw a relationship here because it's much more impacted by language intervention, but there's also a motor planning aspect of this, which is why we saw it to a movement intervention. And then this is really compelling new research that has come out looking at actually the neurochemical impacts of rhythmic auditory stimulation. So what, what this was a, this was a study that showed that doing motor synchronization to uh, rhythmic auditory stimulation attenuate, attenuates dopaminergic response in the ventral striatum. So the ventral striatum is largely responsible for uh, active attention or cognition. So basically what the study showed was that when they were moving to rhythmic auditory stimulation, there was less attentional load needed in order to enact the movement. So it gets back to that sort of subconscious cue that the brain was getting. Why this is important is that people who have Parkinson's disease, so like that video that you saw at the beginning of that man walking, they lose the automaticity of walking. So what, what happens when you lose automaticity is it requ requires a lot uh, more intensive cognitive load to take on movement. So you have to think about everything that you're doing, which is why movement is difficult. So this could have drastic implications for people with Parkinson's disease and the fact that it attenuates the dopamine to the ventral striatum, allowing for less cognitive load to be there, allowing for more natural or autom automatic movement. So very compelling here, because now this is getting, we, we've talked about sort of high level neuroscience, we've talked about neuroplasticity, and this is actually looking at neurochemical impacts of RAF. So this is early studies, and I believe that the, the authors of this are uh, replicating this in Parkinson's disease now. And it's also been shown that our, the intervention actually reduces falls in part people with Parkinson's disease, which has very important impacts on both independence and people's quality of life and really to the healthcare ecosystem at large. And then this is a very uh, interesting video that I always like to show at the end of this section on, on gait training, which is looking at rhythmic auditory stimulation in spinal cord injury, so incomplete spinal cord injury. There are no studies that have been done to my knowledge that have looked at rhythmic auditory stimulation in spinal cord injury. Now, I certainly have hypotheses for why clinically this could be possible, but nothing has shown, nobody's ever studied it before. But in, in practice, uh, through our, our clinic and our, our therapists, we um, uh, treat patients with spinal cord injuries and we've seen some pretty interesting results. And so I'll leave you with this compelling video um, to, to end this uh, section here. Music and impact speech and language. So at a very high level, and this is what I was just mentioning in response to my other uh, uh, point here was that um, 
as we think about language, expressive language is primarily a left-sided brain function. So your ability to speak uh, language primarily comes from the left hemisphere. Um, however, we know that music engages both hemispheres. And what we've seen is that people, when they have deficits in language due to a stroke or a brain injury, they have what's called aphasia, which is just the, ability, the inability to express any language at all. And so what we have seen actually is that patients who can't speak can sing. And what's interesting is because music, uh, because the language is so left hemispheric, if they have damage to that left, left hemisphere, that's why you lose the ability to express language. But if you still have right hemisphere intact, singing using melody and rhythm actually engages right hemisphere function. So for example, um, if I just used just the speak the phrase, I need the bathroom. That's to express that, that's primarily a left-sided brain function. But if I just add melody uh, and rhythm to it or intonation and rhythm to it and say, I need the bathroom, just by adding that intonation and rhythm, I'm engaging the right hemisphere for the expression, expression of that language. So when we take that, what we can do is that we can actually teach people to speak again through what looks like singing. It's an intervention that's called melodic intonation therapy. And so this is a man who's also had a stroke, um, who has al almost no expressive language at the beginning of this video. He's actually having a little bit of a hard time singing as well, but has no expressive language, um, but his comprehension is good. So he understands everything that I'm saying to him and he understands language in his environment and he understands that he can't speak well, but he has no expressive language at this point. Try it again. So no language there at all. Um, we try singing. Early on, singing was also difficult. He has a beautiful voice, but not really getting the words correct. I'm... And what I'm doing here is I'm tapping his left hand and we're doing melodic phrases. So I'm saying, I'm Peter. So I'm using melody and intonation and rhythm to try to engage his right hemisphere. Also, I'm tapping his left hand to give him a rhythmic and tactile um, feedback, but also the right hemisphere of your brain controls the left side of your body. The left hemisphere of your brain controls the right side of your body. So I'm tapping his left hand to tactily engage the right hemisphere, which is what we're trying to recruit for language. And you'll notice in this section here that he starts to approximate the sounds. He doesn't get the words perfectly, but he's starting to approximate the sounds correctly. Peter, I'm Peter, I'm Peter. How are you? How are you? And then we did intensive training over a few months doing melodic intonation therapy. And this is Peter now. Hello, I'm Peter. How are you? I am good. Thank you. How are you? You hear a big difference here. You are my sunshine, my only sunshine. And then as we look at this, sort of why these things can happen as well. So this is a really interesting study about the arcuate fasciculus again, where we looked at, uh, we didn't, this is not my study, sorry. Uh, the, the researchers looked at um, uh, instrumentalists or musicians versus non-musicians. And what they found was that this arcuate fasciculus is the part of the brain that connects Wernicke's to Broca's area. Wernicke's is primarily responsible for language comprehension, Broca's area to language uh, 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 production. And what they showed was that musicians have a thicker arcuate fasciculus than non-musicians. They then showed that singers have a thicker arcuate fasciculus than instrumentalists. They then did folks who had severe aphasia. So people had lost language ability and they did intensive melodic intonation therapy and showed that from pre to post intervention that those folks who were non-musicians actually showed an increase uh, in the thickness of the arcuate fasciculus 
again, demonstrating neuroplasticity from an actual uh, uh, anatomical perspective. Quick clarifying question, uh, Mr. Harris. Yes. What about dancers? Did they do a study and compare dancers who are interacting with music as well as singers and, and instrumentalists? I do not know of that. Um, however, I would hypothesize based upon how we know even things like rhythmic auditory stimulation impact neuroplasticity. I would hypothesize that there would be similar outcomes there. I mean, you know, this is sort of an existential question, but is walking to rhythm dancing? I would argue it's pretty close. So there's a movement, a, a purposeful movement to a temporal signal. I would hypothesize that if we looked at their brains, they would look a lot like musicians. Thank you. And then outside of just language recovery, we also have interventions to improve articulation, to improve fluency, to improve pacing of, of language, also to work on voice and oral motor control. So we know that all voice starts with the breath and we can entrain, um, uh, entrain breathing to rhythm to improve vocal quality for those who have voice disorders as well. So that was very fast, I, I know, and we're gonna keep this last section fast as well, which is talking about music and cognition, um, which covers attention, memory, et cetera. And for, um, uh, with neurologic music therapy, we also have standardized interventions that help to improve sustained attention, divided attention, alternating attention, what's called hemispatial neglect, which is something that can happens often in response to traumatic brain injuries or strokes. We can work on memory, executive functions, orientation, et cetera. Um, I'm going to skip over this video for now, and I'm actually going to skip this as well, the, the neglect training, and talk a bit about, um, and talk a little bit about uh, memory here, because this is a topic that comes up um, very often. Um, and the topic of memory, and, and people ask this, uh, this question a lot, but when we think about uh, uh, music, what's, what's really fantastic is that your brain likes to hold on to uh, emotionally salient information. So for example, your brain responds better to your name versus random words. Your brain responds better to familiar voices rather than stranger, strangers' voices. Your brain responds better to music than it does to spoken words by and large. And your brain responds best to music that you like because of the emotional salience. When you think about memory, your <clears throat> memory holds on to things that are emotionally salient. It also does this thing called chunking when it you know, chunks pieces of information together. Um, so for example, if you think about how we learned the ABCs, right? It was singing, right? And a lot of people think, well, we sing with children because it's fun, it's engaging for them, we can keep their attention. And while that's true, there's also a much more functional purpose behind the songs in helping us remember things. Because, the, because of this chunking that happens, uh, if you think about music, the phrases of music are naturally chunked. So your brain stores an entire phrase together as one piece of information. So for example, with the ABCs, your brain didn't learn 26 individual pieces of information, A, B, C, D. It actually learned about six pieces of information, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, and it stored that together. Now the seven plus or minus two is a research and memory formation that shows that your brain can hold on to seven plus or minus two, so five to nine digits within each of these chunks, which is actually why it's fascinating when you think about singing with children, that when we get to the ABCs, that it goes A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, M, M, N, P. That happens a lot because, well, one, there's an oral motor control that's difficult, but that section of the ABCs actually violates the seven plus or minus two rule. So where it gets interesting is that we actually use this uh, element of chunking and um, musical memory to help people post injuries reform new short term memories. So we can come up with songs to remind them of days of the week and their orientation where they are, um, their names, uh, ADLs, so songs about tying shoes, songs about brushing teeth and these types of things to help reform new uh, memories. And if you ever question that this works, I would encourage you to try to find a song that you haven't listened to in 10, 20, 30 years, but at one point you knew the words to. And if you turn on that song right now, um, you may not remember as it's going what the first word is. But once you hear the song and you hear that first word, 
I guarantee the rest of the phrase will immediately come back to your memory and you'll be able to sing it or speak it. And the reason that that is, is because the first word serves as a cue to pull out the rest of the chunk of that information. And so that's how we use it functionally with our patients. And then just, I'm gonna end here with some more severe injury uh, research here, which I think is some of the most compelling research that we have in, um, in, in this field. Where we looked at folks that were actually in a vegetative state and minimally conscious state. And they looked at silence versus white noise versus recorded music versus live preferred music. And they looked at uh, both um, behavioral scales um, and they also looked at imaging. And what they found was that patients in a vegetative state and minimally conscious state responded best to live preferred music. They showed greater levels of arousal, which is eye opening and interaction. I put cognition here broadly, but it's interaction with their environment. So moving their eyes to stimuli in space. That they showed improved uh, levels of arousal and attention in response to music that they liked, which is really compelling. What we also know is that music is processed through the brainstem and your brainstem is what helps to control your automatic functions. So things like heart rate and breathing rate. So even when people have profound brain injuries, well, we can typically use music as a therapeutic intervention because it's processed through such a basic fundamental part of our brain. So it's literally one of the first things that we gain as human beings. And one of the last things that we lose as human beings is the ability to respond to music, even physiological responses to music. So this is the video that I'm gonna ask you to please not record if possible. Um, and this is pause the video now. Again, if you'd like. Um, and so the one thing I'm just gonna end and then I'm happy to take questions here. The, the one uh, next thing is um, this just came out the end of last year, which is they actually showed in very preterm babies, which are babies who are less than 32 weeks gestational phase that they, gestational age, excuse me, this is a DTI um, diffuse tensor imaging that they showed that they improved structural maturation in white matter pathways that are responsible for things like uh, emotional regulation, et cetera, um, in response to music therapy versus a control group, which was, which was nothing. And there's a lot we don't know about that right now, but I think if we look at where the next frontier is, it's severe brain injury, understanding how these patients respond. It's very preterm babies. And it's folks like my friend, uh, Christine, and we don't have time, I won't show you this, but who had a very severe meningitis or so very rare brain disease and had a miraculous recovery um, through neurologic music therapy. And so that's really the next frontier is to understand we've got a foundation, but to really push the envelope with disease states here. Um, so this is my, my last piece here. So if there's nothing else that you take away from this today, uh, I hope you take this away that a brain that engages in music will be changed by engaging in music. So this is not just a fun intervention that when we engage, our patients in music, it literally changes the anatomy of the brain. It can be um, implemented from birth to death across functioning levels of severe um, to, to non-severe injuries. And from what we see in clinical practice and what we see in the research, I fully believe that this research and the growth of the field will change the landscape of global healthcare as we think about and understand the profound impact that music has to impact the human condition. And I think that technology is gonna be a very important aspect of this growth to help us to reach more patients. So with that, thank you so much. Here's my email address. I'm always happy to be a resource, but I appreciate your attention and I'm happy to take more questions. Thank you very, very much, Brother Harris. That was really awesome. Um, we have a couple of questions in the chat window that I'd start with first before we open them up to the floor. Bailey Smith asks, asks are there any contra uh, indications to using music therapy in those with sensory processing disorder, auditory hypersensitivity? Great question. And so we see sensory processing disorder a lot with the, the folks that we work with, with autism or developmental delay, et cetera. I would say that the great thing about music, and you know, this comes back to the, I think, I mean, I don't, I don't want to try to act like I know anything about physics of music, but you know, at, you know, coming back down to the thinking about the actual type of input that we're using, music can be very broad for everything from 
I would consider a metronome to be music, right? It's, it has a melody, it has a pitch, it has a frequency and it has rhythm, right? So my point is that we can use, uh, we use music a lot with people with sensory processing disorders. We just have to be much more careful and much more mindful about what that stimulation looks like and also be aware of when overstimulation happens and these types of things. So I would say music in general, potentially a contraindication. Using it clinically, not so much because we can account for that. Frank, would you like to elaborate on your comment at all in the chat window? Yeah, I, uh, I work for Maine Veterans Homes and we are a um, memory care unit here in Machias, working with dementia, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, because uh, I'm a maintenance guy, but I mean, I'm, you know, I'm on the unit a lot every day and I see the same residents over and over again. And, uh, and I see the, the residents that have physical therapy. And we have a guy that's, you know, in a wheelchair, he's lost his ability to walk. And just when he does try to walk, it's very difficult for him to get his legs to move in the right direction. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm going to mention it to the physical therapist. You know, have you tried putting something to music to get him to move his right and left leg at different times? Because he tries to move them both at the same time and he falls, right. you know, and and, uh, and then that's when I come in and have to pick them up. But, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a very interesting thing with the music. I just, just astounds me. And it likely would be very uh, applicable. And I mean, I, I haven't done the clinical assessment, but you know, the way you describe is that it may be helpful. I mean, I think the important thing is tell the physical therapist to do it. But the one very important aspect of this is that the music that's used must be at the right speed or the right tempo. So this is not about like, hey, I want somebody to walk better. So I'm just going to randomly throw on ACDC and see what happens, right? So I we was just going to say ACDC. That's amazing. So ACDC might be appropriate for some folks, but it's really about the tempo of the music aligning to the tempo of the patient to begin with. So just encourage that. Yeah, that's what I was. Yeah, I understand that part of it because when you said, you know, you play the music with the rhythm of his breathing. Mm -hmm. I understood that to be very important, you know. It is. Because this is about, you know, we use this very purposefully, but it's these are individualized interventions. And so, you know, that's one of the, the most important things that we can do in education of, of these types of interventions for the field is that, you know, everybody knows that music is good, right? Everybody knows that music is good for health. But if we're thinking about these specific outcomes, they must be clinically applied. So, you know, it's not just these random moments of music that, you know, I mean, there's nothing wrong with listening to music, right? These are, these are wonderful things, but if you're, we're talking about expecting an outcome, they must be individually and clinically applied. I got a radio in my office that never is never shut off. I love it. I love it. Other questions from uh, folks on the line. Can I ask a question? Of course. So Brian, this is amazing. I, I hear it. I've heard it more than once. I heard your main science podcast and I'm still, every time I hear it, I'm just like, this is amazing. But so I'm wondering, right, as, as, as uh, Luke mentioned, I, I do physics education research. So I look at the learning and teaching of physics and we have people who are looking at, you know, cognitive science to, to help us understand things. So I'm wondering too, like, the, the carryover to me is really the, is, it, is the amazing part that, right? Like when the music stops, they still have some take up of it. And I'm, do you have any sense of how much of that is they're just remembering the music they played or the beat they had or whether it's actually internally, I mean, I understand the neuroplasticity but I can't tell if they're thinking about the beat or just it's, it doesn't have to be that conscious. It's a great question. Um, and if we use sort of walking as an example, if we use that actually that video of George, right? So there's two things that I think are, are happening there. You know, one, in, one intervention, as we think about with the outcome that you saw, he was not walking that way the next day that I saw him. I mean, he was not sort of, you do it once and you're healed, right? And we know from principles of, of neuroplasticity that frequency and consistency are important. So we need, you know, lots of, uh, of training in order to, to, to do that. And as we think about that very specific experience, I would say that um, 
at the end of that in intervention, we had sparked some new pathways. So we had engaged some new parts of the brain that allowed the movements to be easier. But he absolutely was thinking in his mind, left, right, left, right, in that moment. Over time, as we do it, the functional outcomes that we see are then due to the neuroplasticity. So I would argue from what we know about this and what we know about neuroplasticity, there was no neuroplastic event that happened in that moment, um, that it was more of the activation of, of new pathways. And then over time is when we see the, the neuroplasticity happen. For gait training from our research, what we suspect is that it takes about two weeks of treatment, uh, two to three times a week to get the first therapeutic bump to actually like see a, a statistically significant difference between beginning and a new function. And then we, we think it takes about three to six months of the treatment in stroke. So this is specific to stroke, three to six months to see that neuroplastic change where they're at their new plateau. So I don't know if that gives any sort of context there, but that's how we think about it clinically. Yeah, it sounds like about the time of a semester that we're trying to teach concepts and have them get internalized, right? I mean, I see a lot of parallels that like, we're trying to get some neuroplasticity and make new connections in the brain about different ideas, right? So it's, this is more motor oriented, but it's the same. I think there's a lot of parallels. That's really cool. Well, it is because I mean, that's neuroplasticity, you know, like literally right. neuroplasticity is, is doing something Learning. over and over again, right? Frequency and consistency. And then what's so exciting about, uh, you know, the, and the clear thing about music in this way is that I always have to make when I give these presentations to healthcare, uh, uh, workers as well is that, you know, this is not working because music is fun. Therefore, people will do it more. You know, like that, that is a, an element of this that's a positive, right? It's engaging, it's motivating. Like this is literally working because it's engaging new elements of the brain. And then with that frequency and consistency is why we get such great outcomes. Same with physics. It's not just fun. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> like math. <laughs> Any other questions? I have a couple, uh, pretty, I, I hope pretty uh, quick ones. Um, I'm, it's sad to see our brothers from uh, Greece and India no longer on the line, but I know it's late over there. Um, I'm wondering if other alphabets and other languages have the same similar chunking pattern of seven plus or minus two, uh, and what their alphabet songs look like. So, What's, well, I don't know the answer to the alphabet. Song. Well, actually in Greece, I'm pretty sure they have a similar alphabet song because we did that with children while I were there. They have something similar. India, no idea. Um, so I'm not gonna, not gonna speak to that. But what, what gets interesting about the different cultures is that from a, from a musical perspective, well, universally, regardless of culture, these objective elements of how music engages the brain are applicable across cultures. However, the subjectivity of music is very different. So where this matters is more in things like harmony. So the har harmonic elements are different in Eastern cultures versus Western cultures. Also the, the, the um, topic that John did not want to go into, which is things like semitones, like that matters in, in, in sort of different cultures. However, as we think about fundamentally, uh, regardless of the culture you come from or your background or your ethnicity can respond the same way to the interventions. You just want to try to use different music. And what does it look like in, say, Mandarin, where it's more of a picto uh, language or written language than it is? Uh, so, you know. I love this question because we don't know the answer to that. But my, my biggest question around that is people who have aphasia, because I've treated patients from all over the world. I've been very, very fortunate. But patients who speak Mandarin, or any tonal language, let's just call it a tonal language in general. Yeah, something that's got the you have aphasia. I want to know, does it take more damage to impact language, number one? Because they, they've got such robust connection, they must have ro such more robust connections in that arcuate fasciculus. Or conversely, would they actually respond better to melodic intonation therapy because their brains are more primed with those pathways? We don't know the answer. But based upon what we know about mute, like there, there must be something there. So that the tonal languages are fascinate me in that in that That's regard. Great open question that is. Correct. Can I ask something? Go for uh, it, please, John. So this is probably a stupid question, 
but I've never, I'm old, but I've never heard of the difference between a tonal language and another language. So could you guys tell me a little bit about that? Sure. So typically more of the uh, Asian countries speak in what is considered a tonal language, which to keep it, I guess, the simplest literally means when you change the intonation pattern of the sounds, it changes the meaning of the word. So if I say to you, for the example that we just had, and to keep this in, I guess, in English, if I say, I, or if I, even if I sang to you, I need the bathroom, you know that that means I need the bathroom. If I flipped it and just said, I need the bathroom, it still means I need the bathroom. In tonal languages, the actual tones that you use are as equally as important to the sounds that you use. So those two, uh, you know, like I'm gonna, again, I'm keeping this very simple, but saying, how are you means something different than saying, how are you because of the intonation pattern. I get it. It's kind of like, dude, dude. Yeah, dude. exactly, exactly. exactly. Yeah. That's awesome. Thank you so much. Of course. That was very oversimplified, but that was the sort of general theme of tonal languages. <laughs> Well, I would like to thank you again, both uh, Professor Thompson and Mr. Harris for, for coming on this morning and, and talking to us about the uh, physics of, of sound and then how it can be implemented in a therapeutic manner to help people with neurological disorders. I think that's uh, phenomenal and fascinating. Um, and uh, and I, please everybody join me in giving them a wonderful hearty round of applause. So thank you. Well, thank you for uh, having us. It's, it's Truly been an honor. So I appreciate it. And please feel free to reach out if there's anything we can do to be helpful. Oh, if, I don't like to speak for John. If there's anything that I can, I can do to be helpful in the future. Yeah, please ask Brian if there's anything I can do to be helpful. That <laughs> so no, thank you. This was, this was amazing. I really enjoyed the whole morning. So thanks. Now, next up, uh, I'd like us, we're going to take a little break here. And then we have Professor Welcomer, who is the Dean of the Honors College at University of Maine. And her students will be here uh, to do one of my favorite parts of our celebration of arts and sciences is to listen to uh, these folks in the Honors College uh, present their, their research that they've been working on. And so I'm very excited for that, but let's take a, um, a five minute break. Uh, and if it's okay with everybody, we'll come back at say around 1135 and then we'll, uh, we'll get started. I'll have Dr. Welcomer kind of just give an overview of the Honors College, and then I've got the order in which the students will present. Uh, but before we go on our break, uh, George, did you want to talk a little bit about National History Day, which is something the Maine Masonic College continues to uh, sponsor uh, year to year? I know there was some talk about it in the chat, and we'd love to give you uh, some, uh, some time to speak towards that and, and what it is that we do and what you're looking for. Great. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, National History Day was something that was introduced to us probably five or six years ago, maybe longer since this is our 16th uh, celebration of arts and sciences and I would have said five but uh, To me, it struck me as science fair because I grew up through high school doing science fair. So National History Day is something that starts in each school that's interested in it, each either high school or junior high school in the state of Maine. And they have a local contest and they have many, uh, many different categories. The one I started out judging was posters or demonstration type of thing. And that's why I think the science fair connection came so close to that. And I couldn't believe how much energy and how much research and how much these, these kids at every level put into their projects. And instead of being based, of course, on science, it was based on something that happened in history. They pick a theme. So this year it's communication in history. And the kids have to take something that has communication and how it impacted history. And uh, after doing the posters and the demonstrations for a while, it just so happened I switched over to something they called performance. And it's not just because I could sit there and the kids came to me instead of vice versa. That had nothing to do with that. But what performance was, was actually they put together a play to demonstrate 
their research in history. And um, this year was amazing because usually I do this the high school and you expect high school kids to really be into the drama and really put together a really good performance. But I ended up with junior high this year. And what happened is there's, there's two, two um, contests this year. The first one was called Draft Day. And that's where the kids kind of put together a project. Some of them were done, some of them weren't done. And we, uh, as judges, we, we watched it and we made comments on how they could improve it so that in a month when we actually do the real state level National History Day, when they, they used to go to the University of Maine at Orono and have a, a, a statewide contest, just like we used to do a science fair, of course, it's virtual now, so you watch it on your computer. But uh, I lost my train of thought. But in a month, they're going to get together. They're going to they're going to all do it. Everyone in draft day moves to the state uh, level. And are they uh, looking for judges currently? And if so, what are the uh, what are the prerequisites for being a judge at at History Day? You really just need to be interested in learning and helping people out. So you could be a student at the University of Maine Honors College if that was something you were interested in. I, I would think so. Absolutely. Okay. Perfect. But, uh, Just wanted to clarify that. So. It, it's well worth it. It's well worth it. You'll learn stuff. You'll be entertained. These kids, like the, even the, ju the junior high kids, are even more dramatic than the high school kids, believe it or not. I can believe that. I've worked in middle school kids before. So. And their performances varied all ends of the spectrum. And they took this communications theme to, to places I would never even have thought. One of them was so clever, she took a Christmas carol and she turned it into an environmental carol. And she parodied the whole thing all the way through with the ghosts. And the greatest thing that caught my attention, she used plastic to make a chain and she put it around her hands. And she talks about these chains of polymers that hold her to life. So. Very but cool. Anyway, yeah. So I got my email in the chat. If you are interested in being a judge, please send me an email and I'll send you the invitation that the college has sent out. Wonderful. Let's take a quick two minute break and try to come back and reconvene at 1135. And then we'll give the floor to Professor Welcomer and she can tell us a little bit about the Honors College. And then we can see what our, our, um, our young students I guess young compared to me, uh, what our, our college students are working on in the honors college. So thank you all very much, and we'll see you in two minutes. I'll hand it over to Professor Welcomer, and, uh, and we'll go from there. So Professor Welcomer, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Luke. And we certainly appreciate the support of the Maine Masonic College with our honors read. Uh, through the years, it's made an incredible impact on the students, as I'm sure the students that are here today can can speak to a bit. Um, this year has been an, a year like no other, uh, largely because of the pandemic. And as you know, University of Maine has been on a um, somewhat limited face-to-face -face and many virtual class basis. And so um, it's forced us to really rethink how we build community and how we bring people together. One of the interesting things is that um, we've, we've done a whole bunch of different um, uh, kinds of outreach programs and one of them, Bailey, is spearheading with another student called the It's Personal Campaign, uh, which is collecting, and Bailey, please jump in if I'm misrepresenting this, okay? but um, collecting personal goods that are not food type goods that people need like shampoos and soaps and other types of household goods and then uh, distributing them to uh, campus community members that are in need. Did I get that right, Bailey? Yeah, that's perfect. Okay, cool. Uh, we've also done some, we've partnered with Mainbound, which is an organization on campus that specializes in providing outdoor as well as indoor kinds of physical experiences to uh, open up sessions for all sorts of honor students, first years, as well as upper class people to do mountain biking, yoga, paddle boarding, ropes course. The idea being that in this time of the pandemic, so many students are really isolated. 
and um, we need to come together as social beings. And so this, these provide a way. In general, the students that we're, we're with today, William, Bailey, Cam, Cora, and uh, Miranda, hopefully will be joining us later, are in their senior, senior years and are completing a very arduous and um, I would say inspiring process of doing independent research. And they've been on this journey more or less for at least four years coming and what we're gonna see is kind of the culmination of their work. And part of the, you're gonna see kind of the outcome, the thesis, you know, kind of a little bit of their thesis work, the research that they've done. But behind that work is a, is a long process of really thinking through what is research? What is it that I really, what is deep exploration of a topic? And how can I do something that represents what's out there in the world as well as something that's interesting to me and matters to me? And so I hope that you'll be able to hear from them kind of what they've done. Also, you know, kind of listen for the part that matters to them. This process just takes an amazing amount of energy and in a way courage, I would say, because you have to, even in the darkest of nights, when you really have no idea what you're about to, what you're doing, and you feel like maybe you've lost your way, you have to somehow stay engaged. And anybody who's been through that, I'm sure we all have in one form or another, knows that it takes um, a lot of fiber to hang in there. And, and here we are, and these people are just, I'm, I'm so excited to be here. I'm very honored to be among you all. And I cannot wait to hear your thoughts and questions as these really inspiring students present their work. So I'm going to, um, do, you, do you want me to say any more or are we? I that's perfect. I think that's <laughs> a, a, great, a great lead in to, I believe Bailey, you're going first. Is that correct? Sure, yeah, that works for me. Wonderful. Feel free to share the screen and uh, Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the floor, Ms. Bailey West. All right, yeah, thank you all so much for having me. I'm so um, happy to be here. Um, so I am a fourth year biochemistry student in the Honors College, and I work in the lab of toxicologist Julie Goss at UMaine. And before I dive into um, the research, I'd first like to acknowledge all of my collaborators from the Goss Lab and also the nearby McGinnis Lab as well as the funding support that we've received um, and including the support I've received from the Honors College. So in the Goss Lab, um, as I mentioned, it's a toxicology lab. So we study the effects of a popular antibacterial agent known as pyridinium chloride, which is kind of a mouthful, but we call it CPC. And CPC is found in oral care products like mouthwashes. And of course, many of us use oral care products like mouthwashes on a daily basis, but don't often stop and think about how they may be impacting aspects of our health such as our immune function, which is what we're really interested in the Goss lab. And in our lab, we found that this chemical CPC is actually inhibiting an important type of immune cell known as the mast cell, which I'll talk about a little bit more on the next slide. And we're currently working to investigate the mechanism for that effect. So CPC, as I mentioned, is an antibacterial agent found in mouthwashes, such as these two popular mouthwashes here. It's also used in some other products. And it's included in these products because it's very effective at killing bacteria. And this is the structure of CPC shown up here. And because of CPC's efficacy against bacteria, it's been studied quite extensively in the clinical setting with these dental care products. CPC has been shown to be effective against plaque as well as gingivitis. And more recently, CPC was also shown to be effective against the SARS-CoV-2 virus, which is the virus responsible for the COVID-19 pandemic that we're all experiencing currently. So in addition to antibacterial effects, CPC also has some antiviral effects, which are of course of great interest currently. However, there's been a few studies showing CPC to have some negative effects on mammalian cells and Otherwise, besides the dental um, clinical studies, there's been very few studies about CPC's effects on human health more broadly. And specifically, there's a real gap in knowledge about CPC's effects on our immune function. And an important component of this immune function is the mast cell, which is shown here in purple. Mast cells are found throughout the human body in most of our tissues, including major exposure areas like the skin and the oral mucosa. And mast cells really represent a first line of defense against um, allergens and parasites because of their location in these tissues. 
And when mast cells are stimulated by an allergen or an antigen as shown here in blue, they release these granules shown here coming out of the cell, which contain bioactive compounds like histamine, which help alert other immune cells that there's some sort of invader and this helps kicks off, kick, off, kick off the immune response. Now, mast cell function is actually highly dependent on calcium. So we often think about calcium as being important for strong bones. Calcium is also really important for the function of all of our cell types, including our immune cells. So in this diagram over here, um, everything above this double line represents stuff outside of the cell. And then the stuff in here is everything going on inside of the cell. So again, the allergen responds to these receptors on the outside of the cell. And this kicks off a bunch of signaling events inside of the cell, leading to the mobilization of calcium within the cell. And this mobilization of calcium is really the crucial signal that allows the mast cells to release their granules. The granules can move up to the surface of the cell and then release their contents and help kick off that immune response. So to orient you to this graph, we tested CPC's effects on this mast cell function, looking specifically at the release of those granules. And on the x-axis here, we have increasing concentrations of CPC. And to kind of orient you to these concentrations, the range of concentrations that we're testing is about a thousand fold lower than the concentrations found in consumer products. So these concentrations are quite relevant to human exposure. And then on the y-axis here, we have the response of the mast cells releasing their granules. And as you can see visually in the graph, some of these low concentrations are significantly inhibiting the mast cell function and the release of their granules. And specifically, we see about 25% inhibition of mast cell function with these low dose CPC doses that we tested. So once we found out that CPC is inhibiting the function of mast cells, our next question naturally became, what is the mechanism for this effect? How is CPC inhibiting mast cells? So as I mentioned, mast cell function is crucially dependent on calcium. And that's really the key signal for mast cells. So we decided to investigate CPC's effects on calcium mobilization within mast cells. And to orient you to this graph here, so um, the bar on the left, these cells were stimulated with an allergen um, as shown here. And then the bar on the right, these cells were also stimulated, but they were also exposed to CPC. And then the y-axis represents calcium levels within the cell. And as you can see, there's about a 40% reduction in intracellular calcium, again, with these low CPC doses relevant to human exposure. So that leads into the current work that we're doing and kind of our future directions. Now that we know that CPC is inhibiting calcium, our next question is, well, how is CPC inhibiting calcium? It must be inhibiting something upstream of calcium within the signaling of mast cells. So that's what I'm currently investigating for my honors thesis, and we're still in the process of doing those experiments currently. And overall, this work is really pertinent to consumer health, and especially now that there's such a growing interest in using CPC against the current pandemic, these toxicology studies on CPC are really crucial for making accurate risk versus benefit um, assessments of CPC. And that is all, and I'd be happy to take any questions. I've got a quick clarifying question, though everyone else feel free to to unmute and jump in. Are these all mast cells or are these mast cells targeted in certain locations, like in like say the liver or the kidney or um, where are these mast cells located? Because if I'm like, if I'm ingesting CPCs and it's having an impact on my mast cells, I'm curious, well, is it my kid mast cells in my kidney or is it the mast cells in my fingernail? I don't even know if I have mast cells in my fingernail, but you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, mast cells are really ubiquitous in the human body. They're found in most tissues. And really the ones that are really pertinent to exposures like CPC are the oral mucosa, because if you're using mouthwash, of course, that's where you're gonna have the most exposure. Mast cells are also found in the GI tract. So if there's any absorption there, you could have effects there. Um, and also mast cells are found in the skin. So any topical exposure of CPC um, could be you know, interfering with mast cells there. But of course, all of our work is done in cell culture. So we're not looking at specific sites versus another. But um, yeah, mast cells are found kind of throughout the whole body. They're even found in the brain. So they're very ubiquitous. In a uh, follow-up question, and I apologize if other people have questions, feel free to hop in. Um, what happens if mast cells don't function, right? If they, if they fail to function, what, what happens then? 
Yeah, so if your mast cells aren't functioning, you're likely going to have a decreased immune response when they're supposed to be stimulated by some sort of allergen or antigen. And mast cells, although it's one type of immune cells, they're very similar to a lot of other types of immune cells. We often think of T cells as being one of the major players in our immune function. And T cells share the same biochemistry as mast cells. So we hypothesize that if mast cells are being inhibited, other immune cell types likely are as well, which we hope to test in the future. So in addition to the inhibition from the mast cells, there's likely possibly also inhibition of other immune cell types too, which we do hope to investigate further. Great, and there is a question in the chat window uh, from Michael McDonald. After your work with CPC, how would you recommend the use of mouthwash? Have you like stopped using it altogether or? Yeah, that is an excellent question. And again, I think it really comes down to risk versus benefits. So personally, you know, I'm not at high risk of things like gingivitis, things that CPC is really effective for. So I personally don't use CPC mouthwashes. However, you know, it really is risk versus benefits. So for someone who is at high risk of oral diseases like that, you know, maybe the benefits may outweigh the risks. And that's why, you know, we're really trying to fill this gap in knowledge so we can have more information and make better assessments um, in this regard. But yeah, so we're not trying to say recommend against CPC, you know, in any way, but um, we just need more information. And again, you know, it's very promising that CPC is effective against the SARS-CoV-2 virus. So in those instances too, again, the benefits likely outweigh the risk. I think it, it just kind of depends on that assessment. I have a is quick it, question. Oh, go for it, George. Uh, you were saying you need calcium in order for the, the body to really react to an a allergen type of thing. If you have too much calcium, does your body overreact? Or is it like a certain limit that stops? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think I'm not as familiar with the dynamics of like calcium physiology per se, but I know that cells have really tight ways of regulating the amount of calcium that comes into the cells. So a lot of it may stay outside of the cell and not necessarily impact the function inside of the cell. So yeah, that's a, a great question. And I wish I had a more concrete answer for you, but to my understanding, the cells you know, are quite regulated in how they um, mobilize calcium. Do you know if CPC is effective against other coronaviruses besides the COVID strain? Like, cause I know a bunch of common colds I think are kind of like coronavirus type things as well. I imagine CBC would be effective against coronaviruses. I haven't specifically seen other evidence for it, but CBC is effective against um, the lipid envelope, kind of the outside part of the virus, which all coronaviruses would have. But CBC has also been shown to be effective against influenza, other respiratory viruses, um, hepatitis B virus. So it's actually been shown to have efficacy against a few different viruses, which is um, pretty, pretty exciting. That is kind of cool. Thank you. Other questions? Thank you very, very much, Bailey. Really enjoyed the presentation. So you'll see people clapping. You may not hear them because we're all muted. So, and I believe up next is Cam Spicer. I believe so too. I'm ready. Cam, welcome. Thank you. All righty. So, hello everyone. Thank you, Bailey, for kicking it off. You did did awesome. Uh, easy. Easy act to follow, probably not. Um, my name is Cam Spicer. I'm a senior finance and financial economics student here, and I've been part of the Honors College for four years, as Professor Welcomer explained. Uh, thank you again to Professor Welcomer for setting this up with you guys. Um, this is a great experience for all of us, so it's really exciting to tell you more about my honors thesis, which is not in the field of biochemistry, but it is in the field of finance. So if you can switch your brain on to uh, the financial markets and what you know about that, it'll probably help you uh, in understanding my project. So I studied an exchange in the field of market microstructure called the Investors Exchange. And it is a project on market fragmentation as a whole, as well as the, the type of model that the Investors Exchange implemented into the US market system and what's been happening with that and high frequency and computer-based trading. So my project was inspired by a book called Flash Boys and a lot led up to this, but Flash Boys was written by Michael Lewis who also wrote some other really popular books such as Moneyball and The Big Short. And he's been doing um, 
this type of work on financial markets for quite a while. And the book starts out explaining a company called Spread Networks and their project where they they built a dark fiber cable between New Jersey and Chicago in the straightest line possible with, with no worry of any cost. And the purpose was to sell access to this line to high frequency trading companies, uh, firms who use computers to make trades rapidly in the stock market and uh, use methods to make money off of trades. And after introducing this, he explains the story of how the Investors Exchange came to be through the, the CEO of the Investors Exchange, Brad Katsuyama's journey of learning about what was going on with high frequency trading and how he realized that it was an unfair advantage that they had in his idea. So quick, it's important to have some definitions of algorithmic trading versus high frequency trading. So algorithmic trading is using computer programs to implement investment decisions and trading strategies. And high frequency trading is a subcategory of algorithmic trading where highly computerized trading strategies rely on fast access to trading platforms and market information. So here's a quick example of, of what's going on in the markets with high frequency trading. Uh, this is one I, I discovered that I thought was really cool to share, and it has to do with the spread network start cable line. So in 2015 and 2016, there was a bunch of macroeconomic events in China that had to do with um, their, their financial loan systems and some collapses that had there that they had there. And those macroeconomic events came into the US and impacted the markets here in a way that caused the high frequency trading systems to kind of go haywire. And as you can see here in the graphs to the right, these are the cancel to trade ratios for um, every exchange in the US market, but you can only see two, the Chicago Stock Exchange, which is now um, owned by the New York Stock Exchange is called NYC Chicago. And then the National Stock Exchange, which was bought by um, NYSE and is not in operation anymore. And these ratios are um, upwards of 2,000, 3,000, and 4,000 cancels per single trade executed. And those numbers are so extreme that only computers are capable of, of reaching them. Ultimately, why does this matter? It matters because markets have become more and more fragmented in the last 25 years. In the past four years alone, there's been four new stock and options exchanges uh, making the total 29. And then there's been 21 alternative trading systems, which are, um, are trading platforms owned by banks or private companies and places other than actual public exchanges where you can still trade stocks. So here's a picture of what market fragmentation looks like uh, over the past 25 years. In, Pre-1995, it was like you see in the cliche Wall Street movies where there's people on the floor trading in person and they have access to what the prices are. Moving forward, uh, the SEC allowed for computer-based trading systems to emerge and that's where broker rules start to change. And after 2000, the SEC started to handle all of what was going on with computers coming into the markets. And as you can see, the number of dots explodes. And this comes from every type of trading platform that there is now, along with the regulations that have been implemented. And as you can see, there's over 80 places where you can trade stocks nowadays. So the IEX started by Brad Kautsuyama, outlined in the book Flash Boys, is intended to deter high frequency trading. And they do this by coiling up the dark cable that goes to their matching center so that there is a delay between trades coming in and trades going out so that they can take preventative action to re-pegging the price of orders that are resting on their exchange so that high frequency traders can't beat the trades there and make pennies off trades, which is essentially the predatory behavior that they believe is unfair. So my research for this was looking at not only the IEX, but other speed bump exchanges. And I did this by collecting data for, uh, from the CBOE, uh, the IEX themselves, and the Security and Exchange Commission. And I also collected the same data with um, odd lots, which is trades of 100 shares or less, so really small trades, because these are a proxy for high frequency traders. Um, my analysis that I did was first differences, and then I plan to do a, a 
difference and difference tests and at least I've done least square regressions to show uh, how the IEX fits into the picture as, as a whole. And ultimately my results so far are that the IEX and the NYC American and the NYC American, sorry, is the New York Stock Exchange's copycat model of the IEX that has an access delay of 350 seconds, 350 milliseconds. So they copied the IEX, so I compared the two and both of those exchanges showed that they have more market share without odd lots than with odd lots. Basically what this means is that they have been mostly effective in deterring high frequency trading based on the proxy that I used. Uh, here are some of the regressions that I ran out of the volume over time for the IEX and the NYC American versus the BATS exchange in their first two years. So these are the first two years for each of these three exchanges. And then I also accounted for the first two non-recession years of the BATS exchange. So I included the BATS exchange here because they've been the biggest, they've been, they received a lot of criticism from all sorts of communities for catering to high frequency traders, including in Flash Boys. And as you can see, both the NYC American and IEX volumes have increased over their first two years, whereas the BATS, even when accounting for recession years, uh, have experienced a decrease in their volume. So some conclusions here, the IEX has created a model that serves a unique purpose. And from my research has shown to deter high frequency uh, behavior that is predatory. Um, additionally, the IEX has started a movement of access delays in the market that serve a unique purpose to people who are looking to make trades without the impact of high frequency traders. Ultimately, however, High frequency trading and algorithmic trading must be seen in context. Because of the system becoming so fragmented, there is room for predatory behavior, but it's also highly necessary to have algorithmic traded, trading to keep the market connected. Otherwise, there would it would look like multiple markets in multiple different places, whereas the current app theory in academics is that it is still one stock market with multiple places of entry. And thanks to the SEC, there's regulation that keeps uh, price discovery and market quality uh, pretty cohesive despite how fragmented it is. So uh, to end, thank you guys for coming. And I want to give a shout out to my advisor, Dr. Stephen Jurek in the University of Maine uh, Business School, and then the rest of my committee as well, who have all been very helpful to me. So thank you. Thank you, Cam. Questions for uh, Cam, feel free to either put them in the chat window or unmute yourself. Um, I've got a quick clarifying question. Could you clarify what you mean by uh, predatory behavior? Do you mean taking advantages of a systematic way in stocks that are changed or what, what does that look like? If you could clarify that, that would be awesome. Absolutely, so high frequency traders act off speed. So there are computers who they spend, a, for example, the spread networks line was uh, loaned out to high frequency trading companies for $300,000 per month annually, just to, just to shave millions of a second off of their access to the exchange. So basically what they do is they have a computer that is sending, they're sending trades to all of these 20 exchanges in the market and they're trying to find the orders. So they'll send a trade and uh, they'll see if there's, trades there and then they'll send a really big order to that market and then they'll cancel them before the price updates. So so basically they're they're sending trades and canceling them before the price can update. So they're making pennies off every trade and it's called front running and right. it's in simple forms. So follow up question, the strategy of high frequency trading and algorithmic trading, how does that strategy compared to one of these uh, buy and hold long term types of strategies such as index funds with low, um, low fees like Vanguard's Admiral funds, right? Uh, so on Wednesday I presented to the wealth management team at Bangor Savings Bank and uh, that would be an example of someone who's creating a portfolio and is is one level disconnected from my research. So my research has to do with any type of broker or anyone having direct contact with the exchanges. So the guy who started the, this investors exchange, the IEX, 
he was a trader at the wealth management team at RBC Canada on Wall Street, making a ton of money. And he started this exchange because when he would go to make trades to tr change his portfolio, he would have a picture of what the market looked like on his screen as he describes it. And he would go to sell X amount of shares and then they'd all be gone. And he just didn't understand what was happening. So he was, he was experiencing this a lot and just losing money off of a uh, miniature trade. So even people who are doing this buy and hold strategy, like a Vanguard, when they're updating their portfolio, they need to go through the market through a broker and high frequency traders are, are going to unbelievable lengths, spending millions and millions of dollars to shave millions of a second so they can make money off of those trades. And that spread network slime is a really good example for it because they, for $300,000 per month, they contracted over 150 companies, high frequency trading companies, meaning that all of those companies are probably still profiting. It's a multi-billion dollar industry just doing latency arbitrage, which is basically beating trades to the market using computers. Wow. But on that, on that note, it's important to keep the market connected because there's so many different places. Someone at Bangor Savings Bank couldn't make a trade or update their portfolio as easy if they didn't have a broker who was sending the trades electronically to someone else. And that's why the, the key difference is someone using speed in a predatory manner to uh, manipulate the price. Other so, quick question. question. How close are we to someone figuring out a way to just bring down the whole market as they make money like this? And how fast could the SEC step in to correct something like that? Good question. Uh, that is a great question. And it's kind of happened already. I don't know if you've heard of the 2010 flash crash. So the 2010 flash crash was basically an 8,000% drop in the stock market in, in like, like 15 seconds. And then it went back up because all the algor al all the algorithms basically reacted off each other in a way that, that almost destroyed the market. But that was the event that really pushed the SEC into investigating this. And the more I've done research, the more I've found faith in the SEC because they've done a pretty dang good job of staying on top of it. But with anything, there's there's a lag in the regulation. So despite um, what has been done, there's, there's still going to be things that aren't as regulated, but it is regulated enough to where I still have faith in the market and I've learned a lot about it. So I wouldn't be too skeptical. It is just an interesting topic to know about. But. All right, good news there. Good. Yeah. <laughs> Follow-up question about the flash crash. You said it was 15 seconds. Are, are there people who made a lot of money by, by buying extremely cheap in that flash crash? And then when it went back to where it was, we're like, hey, great, look, I bought 500 million shares of, of this. And now that it's back up, I'm a, a gazillionaire. I mean... Or did the I, SEC say, you know what, we're going to take a mulligan on that, and we're just going to go back to right before those 15 seconds happen. Yeah, the not that I know of, but it was it was one of the pinnacles of events in uh, in the financial realm in the past dozen years. So that definitely something to, to be aware of. That would be to everyone's benefit to keep quiet because <laughs> we do not want that replicated. Replicated, right? Any other questions for Cam? If you don't mind. Yes, by all means. Um, Michael McDonald here. I was wondering if you, the, with the, all the predatory practices, are do you still consider the markets to be efficient? So. I do. And it's, it's important to realize that it's, it's a small number of people practicing the predatory behavior. Uh, the thing that is really the big impact of this research is the fragmented markets. So ultimately you have volume and liquidity. So if you have one exchange and you have a buyer and a seller trying to sell 10,000 shares of a stock in that exchange, the volume is also 10,000. So volume and liquidity are equal. But if you have two exchanges, then you have a broker in the middle and you have a buyer in one exchange and a seller in the other exchange. They go through the broker that makes liquidity 20,000 and volume 10,000. So the actual amount of shares 
being traded is volume and liquidity is all of the behavior happening in between. So when you, when you multiply that across so many markets and alternative trading systems, along with the fact that half of the trades in the markets aren't displayed until they're reported to the SEC because they basically happen in a back room. And that's, that's something that is a totally different topic, but going on to protect people making really big trades like uh, institutions and things like that. When you take all of that into account, it's hard to get a picture of, of where the price is being developed and where volume actually sits on the market. So they are efficient, but they're only efficient because of the problem that we created and solved by uh, fragmenting the market and then using algorithms to keep the market connected. So ultimately, I think the market would be more efficient, but less accessible and um, less convenient for the expansion of financial services that are out there if it was how it used to look. So fragmentation is a problem, but it's a problem that's solved with algorithmic trading and high frequency trading is just a unfortunate defect within what people are able to do with computers. So I, I think the SEC has done a good job regulating it and the IEX has been a good private market solution to um, the predatory behavior. And a lot of people are having success just listing their orders on the IEX because they only hold 3% of the market share for all of this, the stocks traded in the market, but 20% of the orders that are sent to them are filled. And that is the number that's far higher than other ones, which means they have a very good, they capture volume really well. Whereas some exchanges have, they might have a higher market share, but they don't capture the amount of volume that they're actually getting sent because half those shares are getting traded or getting canceled by high frequency guys anyway. Thank you. One of the, one of the problems with, with the, the flash crash was, was cascade failure. And that was um, pr a production of um, conflicting algorithms, which produces a massive amount of, of volume. So, Computers can trade an awful lot faster than humans. And that certainly makes the markets more volatile. Absolutely. That's a very great point. And I think that would be a good way to, something good to study in the future is how, how fragmentation has impacted market volatility. Another interesting question for the future is how have these strategy, strategies potentially led to how quick of a rebound we've seen in this market during a global pandemic. I mean, you know, back last March when it started, the markets went down, but since then they just continue to trend up and up and up. And then you get things like Robinhood and GameStop and it's just, it's fascinating. And it's nice that in the U S you've got the SEC, but you have other places like London and Hong Kong and Japan that obviously they have different types of regulatory uh, groups. Like if you look at what's going on with Alibaba over in China, uh, basically, they're they've gone in and, and they're breaking up, trying to break up Alibaba. Do you feel? Do you have as much confidence in other markets that are not overseen by the SEC than uh, than what you see in the U.S.? And it may not be a fair question because you may not have researched that. So I want to acknowledge that as well before I ask the question. Sure, I, I have seen a little bit about uh, research of fragmentation, at least in Europe and. Uh, there's regulatory bodies all over the world, so I, I can't speak to specifics. What I can say that um, may answer your question and is really just a takeaway for me as a, a finance major is finance is really about human behavior more than anything else. And uh, like anything, there's there's a lot of game theory that goes into like, how are these all of these systems interplaying off each other based on the regulation that, that they have? And GameStop's a great example because it that is an example of human behavior. There was nothing intrinsically valuable about GameStop. It was the behaviors of a small group of people interacting with the behaviors of a different group of people. And then you had a, everyone else kind of just watching what happened and playing off of it and just learning from it. And that's really what finance is more than anything. And I think the people who really understand that are the people who have a lot of success in some way in the field. Bitcoin is something that's purely invented for because we think it has value. 
And exactly, that's a great point. And it's, it's designed to represent where the value is, but sometimes value is in ideas. There's a lot of firms who are valued completely off of basic, their name or their ideas, and they might have no profits to show for anything. A lot of these tech companies, if you look at their financial reports, they have massive investments because they're believed in uh, that their ideas are valuable. And something I learned from one of my professors who's on my committee when I was taking his course in international business is that um, the U.S. doesn't produce much. We are an exporter of ideas. The value of what the U.S. does is in ideas. And that's why there is this push for education and the jobs that people are getting are more of service jobs and our, our market has started to shift in a way that we are a exporter of ideas to the entire world, everything from accounting to finance, to biochemistry, to literature. And we are trying to maintain that power <laughs> through other means because that is what makes us valuable at this point as, as a economy. I just had a flashback to the Freenet videos back in 1990s with Senator Al Gore, sorry. So he talked about the flow of ideas, right? And the economy shifting from the uh, US economy shifting from a, a, an economy of goods to an economy of ideas. Oh, absolutely. Great questions. I feel like we could continue to talk about how markets can help democratize uh, uh, wealth and value. And, uh, you know, maybe this is a topic that we look at in future celebrations of arts and sciences. Um, but that would be, uh, uh, this is a, a good dialogue. Other questions for, for Cam before we move to our next student? Hearing none, thank you very much, Cam. That was, uh, well done, and, and thanks for sharing that. Uh, and Cora, I apologize if I if I mess up your last name. Is it Cora uh, Cook? Cook. Cook. Yeah. Cook. There we go. <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, next is uh, is Cora. She's going to share with us her research that she's been working on. So the floor is yours, Cora. Thank you. Thank you. So my thesis is a little bit different than how what everybody else has presented so far. So I actually made more of a creative uh, artsy thesis. Um, and so mine is, it, it's a tentative title. It's still in the works, but it's called The Hate Within. And so basically what it is, is I'm coming up for my thesis with a novel idea. And because it's not going to be a short story, it's actually going to be basically a um just a regular size novel that's published and normally can be bought at bookstores what's being completed by the time that i graduate is going to be a really detailed outline a couple chapters and then some other pieces of the book to kind of piece it together and i really hope that later on after everything that i've learned because this year has been so much learning and I'll explain later because I, I am not actually an English major, I'm a biomedical engineer. Um, so uh, I decided to kind of go with something that I was super passionate about and be able to learn about it while I'm still in school so that when I go out, I can do this as like a secondary hobby. And um, so basically the synopsis of the story that I'm creating is that there's this popular super sweet girl in her junior year of high school. Her whole life changes when she's diagnosed with a cancerous brain tumor. So the treatment that ends up saving her life and removing the tumor actually ends up basically changing her personality because through physical brain trauma. And she has to learn how to love and accept herself for who she is and not necessarily how others view her. And I have to give a huge shout out to everybody on my uh, thesis committee and especially my advisor, Katie Quirk, because she actually is a published author and she's helped me so much with the creative writing journey. And it's been so much fun. So being the biomedical engineer that I am, of course, we need research and lots of it. So the main thing of what I wanted to do with the story is make sure that the science portion of it, which is kind of medical and psychological, is really accurate. 
So I read a lot of research articles on low-grade gliomas. Low-grade gliomas is the brain tumor that she has. That's what it's categorized as. And uh, different treatments, especially kind of the more experimental ones for cancer. And one of, uh, one of the kind of awesome parts of my thesis is I got to talk to some really cool people and ask their opinions on basically uh, the psychological part of it and then also the medical side. So I got to talk to a neurosurgeon from Yale. His name is Dr. Leighton Lamsam. He's a residential doctor there right now. And then I also got to talk to a therapist and somebody in Connecticut who's a public school mental health provider. She kind of helped me realize more of the struggles of what my main character and some of the secondary characters are going to have to go through with basically trying to learn how to accept themselves when high school is such an emotional, stressful time. And then also the third person's a little weird when you first look at it, but I talked to a family attorney, but the main thing is that she was a huge child advocate in traumatic situations. And she kind of helped me realize when I was looking at the psychological aspect of it, that her personality change is not necessarily just because of the physical trauma that she received through her treatments, but also because of the traumatic realization that she now has cancer, she might die. And then also trauma due to kind of how it tears apart her friendships and her even her family dynamic because of the fact of, wow, we almost lost our kid to cancer. And that could end up changing her personality as well as basically removing part of her brain. And it's crazy how those two things can actually have kind of a similar impact, even though one's physical removal and then the other one's basically mental trauma. And then in addition, I did a lot of book reading. One of the major ones that I gained a lot of knowledge from was the purple novel that's at the bottom called Story. And this was a great book that I learned on plot writing, story writing, and learning how to kind of make a novel that's interesting and continually moving without being dull and boring. And then I also read a lot of books on effective communication, such as nonviolent communication, to basically show the how the main character's communication kind of degrades in the fact that so and uh, the brain tumor is located on her frontal lobe, which is basically going to be personality and she loses empathy or her ability to be able to connect with others. And so I want to show degradation of communication or effective communication throughout the book to show that her personality has changed. And then also I read a ton of YA novels, just a few are basically at the bottom that deal with physical and mental illnesses and basically how these people come to terms with the fact that they're different from everybody else and how they learn to be okay with not fitting in. So uh, as I stated a little bit in the beginning, my motivation for this thesis is I'm a biomedical engineer, but I have a huge passion for reading, writing, and storytelling. Ever since I was like, a little kid, I'm pretty sure I started reading novels before I could talk, to, to be completely honest. Um, but I wanted to be able to kind of combine both of my passions of biomedical engineering and creative writing to create a young adult novel. And the reason why I wanted to create a young adult novel and not just like a novel that's fiction is because I wanted to be able to use this to stimulate younger generations, their interest in the field of STEM by being able to creatively integrate science into the storyline and get kids interested, be like, oh, whoa, these treatments are really cool. I kind of want to look into it a little bit more myself. And that way we can get, we can stimulate more interest. Cause I know as an engineer throughout my four years, we've done so many um, kind of expos where we set up tables and we play with kids with slime and we show them, hey, science is fun. And another really, big thing about why I want to stimulate younger generation is a large portion of why readers are female. And so not only am I uh, stimulating younger generations, but I'm also stimulating women to be like, hey, it's okay to be interested in science. You should join the field. Like if you're interested in this, you should be like, look into these majors. And what's big about why I feel like this is important is there is a huge lack of fictional young adult novels, which kind of dive into the science realm on the market. And like, honestly, if you talk about people with the medical side of what, what YA novels use medical uh, storylines, people are going to basically throw out two, The Fault in Our Stars and Five Feet Apart. But if we can create more of these novels, more people are going to be interested in the medical field. And that's going to help us, especially since, I mean, we have a pandemic going on. So as many people as we can get into the medical field as possible would be great. And uh that's, that's all I have. If anybody has any questions, let me know. 
Thank you. I just find it fascinating. You combine biomedical engineering with becoming a novelist. (laughs) I I, I just, that's really, really, really cool. (laughs) Thank you. I, I was honestly looking forward to being able to do a creative writing thesis since my freshman year. And I learned that my biomedical engineering capstone has to be separate from my honors thesis. And when I talked to the honors college and they said that they would absolutely support me and help me through this process, I was like, this, this is an awesome place to basically just let people run with whatever ideas they want to work on. I agree with John. I think when you take fields that, that people don't look at, usually combining biomedical engineering and creative writing, that's where a lot of innovation uh, comes into play. Um, and um, there is a main science festival that happens in March each year. And one thing that may be uh, an exciting opportunity for you is to reach out. Dr. Thompson, um, I'm trying to remember his, his wife's name. Uh, it's, it's blanking right now. She runs the Maine Science Festival. And, and I think they're looking at how do you take your STEM and turn it into STEAM or including the arts in there. And I think that would be a, a great theme for one of the, the science festivals because I think I think you're right. If you're if you're going to try to inspire people to um, get involved in STEM, you do it through arts. I mean, that's how people are inspired is through the arts. And so I think doing that, and I think uh, I think the the target knowing that young uh, adolescent ladies are reading these is also awesome because you're right. The more people we can get into STEM, uh, the better off we'll be. So, other questions and thoughts. I have a clarifying question. Is that an arm coming out of the, behind you, an arm with a uh, butcher knife or something like that? Yeah, yeah. Um, my favorite uh, holiday is Halloween. And yes. so actually standing back there is uh, Jason from Friday the 13th. And uh, honestly, he's a great security device, even though I also have two dogs and one's a German Shepherd. But when delivery people come and we open the door, they just kind of look and they're like, we're gonna put the food right here. <laughs> we're gonna go. <laughs> I thought it might've been Michael Myers for a second. Uh, <laughs> yeah, he's a, I think he's over six foot as like a statue. That's yeah. <laughs> that's cool. Michael. Uh, um, interesting topic. I, I hope you do well in the, with the creative writing. I, as a person who's done a little bit of uh, writing as well, um, get yourself a really good friend that doesn't mind reading your books as an editor. Uh, There are a number of editing packages that can help you along the way. Um, The two that I use quite regularly are Grammarly and ProWritingAid. Grammarly is a English, as in uh, Great Britain English, English, and pro writing aid is much more of an American English, and they will argue as to what the correct grammar is. There is another package called Campfire, and it helps map out your book and do scenes. So it, it's, an, it's an interesting tool. Um, Thank you. I'll have to look into those. <laughs> there's also one called Persona that talks about how different personality types will conflict. So. Michael, being from New Brunswick, uh, which which English do you prefer, the UK English or the American English? Uh, they massacre both of them. Canadian English is kind of a a, a mix and match of the two, and it, they, they massacre Canadian English completely. So okay. it's, yeah, it's a bizarre it's a bizarre beast. You, you kind of walk the middle of the road. Good point. Uh, Cora, quick question. Have you started, how, like, how far are you into the writing process? Have you finished the novel? Have you, are you a chapter or two in? Where are you in that process? So far, I have a completed outline and all of the kind of like the scenes are mapped out of the book. So I have basically, I think it's 10 pages where it's just listing the scenes and the events that happen. Uh, I have two chapters written and I'm in the middle of the third one. And um, basically kind of like, my goal for by the time I graduate is the outline and timeline are done. I wanted three chapters, which I'm going to kind of edit heavily to get basically, because I I tend to write and then I get in the mindset and I write a lot. And so uh, one of the major things that I learned is basically you're going to cut three quarters of what you write. And that hurts my heart, (laughs) but I'm like, all right, let's see, let's see where it goes. 
Um, and uh, then I'm going to basically, the way I'm integrating STEM into the storyline is not kind of like having a doctor talk and talk and talk because that's, that's a little monologue-ish and also not really what people want to read. But instead, I'm going to create sections of the story which cut to the main character's journal where she's actually taking notes about her treatment, taking notes about her condition and taking notes when she meets with a therapist about what's happening with her mental state. And in this way, it's kind of taking it from this junior in high school, her point of view of being interested in this field and being like, oh, this is a great way to describe what this tumor is like. And um, saying something like, even though apparently it's like a couple millimeters big and apparently it's located the, here in my brain, it's so weird by the fact that I can't tell if there's something different about me compared to everybody else. So that's basically my goal of what I'm gonna have because I don't think it'd be possible to write an entire novel within basically this one semester last year. Um, it's a it's a couple years process and then being able to edit it so it doesn't just sound like something that was a stream of conscious writing would take yet like another year. William, you've got a question. Yeah, I do. Um, Cora, I'm, I'm really interested in your project and I've done some creative writing for honors um, honors courses and assignments in the past, which I think is a really great thing about the honors college that they encourage that type of creativity as they're doing for your honors thesis. Um, but I'm wondering, um, when when I've tried to complete creative writing assignments, um, you have to like communicate your message about a text or, or a book that you've read, and you're doing the same thing with um, STEM and medical research and stuff. So I'm, one, I'm wondering if you've if you've done any of the journal entries yet, if you've found that that language is forced for your character, or if you've come up with a way to um, seamlessly transition between the character outside the journal and inside the journal? So the story itself is written in the past and third person. So when the, the chapters are being written, basically I'm writing the main character's uh, name, Aleda is her name, instead of like, I did this, I'm feeling this, it's more of um, this is happening to Aleda. And then basically at the end of the chapters, which is how in my brain I'm I'm kind of formatting this, there is these pages that are going to probably have a different background if say this ever gets published in like a book and it's gonna be in like a handwriting font. And it's basically gonna be kind of like lines of her being like taking notes almost, but not like, not like legible notes that you take probably in a science class where you just write down facts, but maybe like a fact and then how she feels about it, a fact, how she feels about it. And I know that personally, as definitely always writing reports and uh, kind of like presentations and analyzing data, it's hard for me to switch from being so analytical in writing to creative. So I tend to, it takes me longer than most because I'll actually sit with a YA novel and I'll read for about 30 minutes to an hour to get in that voice. And then I'll go and write. And it's just, it feels natural after reading something like that because you already have a bit of what that age is, what their voice is in your head and they're talking and you can kind of be like, okay, if I were to continue to have that voice, have that mindset, what would I say? Well, I wanna read your novel when it's done. <laughs> so I hope, I hope you'll, you'll share it with, with the group. I guess I'm gonna have to and thank you. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Cora. Much thank appreciated. Thank you. <laughs> Next up, we have William Soames. Did I pronounce the last name correctly? Yeah, yep, that's okay. correct. So William, the floor is yours. Okay, everyone see that okay? All right. Um, so I'm presenting today on my honors thesis research as well. Um, the title of my thesis was Effects of the Transportation and Climate Initiative on the Main Economy, an Analysis of Cap and Invest and its Heterogeneous Impacts on Rural and Urban Household. So my um, thesis was basically about setting the economic impacts of the Transportation and Climate Initiative, which is a regional organization in the United States comprised of um, 13 states on the eastern seaboard ranging from North Carolina to Maine. Um, if you've ever heard of it, and then plus the District of Columbia as well. 
And the purpose of the organization is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in the transportation sector. And the goal that has been set is um, currently 26%. So they're seeking a 26% reduction in emissions by the year 2032. And the uh, mechanism at which they're hoping to implement this is a, is a cap and invest system. I'll explain a little bit about that um, momentarily. So I hypothesized that the Transportation and Climate Initiative Program would impact rural households in Maine disproportionately as compared to urban households. Um, so to test this hypothesis, I, I gathered data from a variety of sources. Uh, I needed demographic data to, to calculate an elasticity estimate for the price elasticity of demand for gasoline. So I got that demographic data from the US Census Bureau, the Department of Environmental Protection, and I also got um, gas prices from the American Automobile Association. Um, so using this data, I, I calculated that the average household in Maine would be expected to reduce their consumption of gasoline by anywhere from 19 to 40 gallons per year in the short run, which translates to approximately 1.8 to 3.3% reduction in emissions. Um, that's, in, that's in one year. And that depends on the price increase that's expected from the Transportation and Climate Initiative Program if Maine decides to join. Um, so I also performed an equity analysis for um, households in different parts of the state. So I found that in rural Maine, um, the average household would be expected to increase expenditures on gasoline by approximately $52 to $92 per year because of the increase expected from the TCIP. And then urban households, the difference would be um, just less than a dollar, really, depending on the price increase, uh, ranging from $51 to $91 per year. Um, if we have any um, members here who have any experience with econ at all, um, the measure of economic burden is illustrated by the red shaded region in this graph here. So um, my findings are relevant for a number of reasons, but the first being that the state of Maine recently passed some legislation mandating statewide emission reductions of 45% by 2030 and 80% by 2050. Um, and I have the title of the act here in quotes um, for you to do your own research on that. But um, I found that the Transportation and Climate Initiative, while it's aimed at reducing a, a substantial amount of emissions um, in Maine, it would be expected to result in approximately 0.6% to 1.0% uh, decline in statewide emissions from the household component of the TCIP. So I, my research looked at households only. Um, the Transportation and Climate Initiative would affect any vehicle that runs on gasoline or diesel. So that would include municipal vehicles, it would include trucks, um, et cetera. Um, so second, my findings are relevant because the Transportation and Climate Initiative program is expected to generate revenues anywhere from um, 26 million to $29 million per year. Um, so annually in the short run, and that there needed to be some indication as to how these revenues should be spent. So my study um, provided some answers to, to those questions as well. And then finally, my findings led me to conclusions about how policymakers should communicate about the program to the public um, if Maine decides to move forward with the program in the future. So including on matters of um, transparency about the price changes that can be expected from the program, uh, the equity implications of the program and, and investments as well. Uh, so that's it for my um, my brief presentation, but I'm happy to take any questions you have. Thank you, William. I've got a couple questions. Um, sure. Though, George, I'm sure working in the DOT, you probably have some, some questions as well. Um, where does the revenue come from that uh, that is projected to, to be generated. Where does that come from specifically in the state of Maine? Yeah, sure. Um, so the, as I mentioned at the beginning, the Transportation and Climate Initiative Program operates on a cap and invest um, system, which is a, sort of a rebranding of cap and trade. So the idea is that um, each jurisdiction in that region, so the state of Maine, would be responsible for auctioning a limited number of allowances to fuel suppliers in the state. 
Um, so each fuel supplier has to hold one allowance for every metric ton of CO2 emissions that are associated with the fuel that they sell. Um, and the current price that's estimated, the starting price for each allowance is about $6.60. So the state would auction off an allowance, like starting at that price to every fuel supplier. They could bid up the price if they want more. Um, well, there's a limited number of allowances, but they can also trade their allowances with other jurisdictions. Um, so that's where the money comes from. The state gets money by selling those allowances to fuel suppliers and then is tasked with redistributing those funds back into the economy. And it has to be uh, for goals that have been explicitly um, stated in the memorandum of understanding of the Transportation and Climate Initiative. So some of the goals are um, expanding public transportation, um, providing rebates for electric vehicles, things like that. Thank you, George and then Michael. That was gonna actually be my question is how we would reduce the, the level down. And if we would be passing laws like California did with the, the cars that need to be sold have to meet this requirement. Um, so how, how to reduce emissions even further? Exactly, yeah. yeah. Um, well, one way would be to set a, a, a higher or a lower cap. So to force um, fuel suppliers to sell less fuel to consumers, um, that would obviously increase the price of gasoline a lot more because when you have less supply, um, then there's, uh, there's still the same amount of demand. So people are, are bidding up the price and that has implications for people living in different parts of the state, which is one of the reasons why I, I did the equity analysis with people in um, places like Aroostook County are driving farther on average to work than someone in Portland. Um, so I think the most interesting, interesting part of my research was finding that the economic burden between households in different parts of the state are, are very similar. Um, and there's a, there's a number of reasons for that. I'm having to go into that further if that's something you'd like to, to hear about. But I'd say the answer to your question, the most direct would be to um, set a more stringent cap, which is not something that any of the jurisdictions want to do at this time. It, it took a while to agree on the, the cap that was um, decided on. And I will say too that over the next 10, 12 years, over the, the span of this project, emissions are already expected to decline by 24.3%. So the Transportation and Climate Initiative is adding about 1.7% onto that. It's a very, very small amount. When you say uh, limit the, the gas, you mean like ration how much gas is sold to the public? Or? Um, so if, if all fuel suppliers are required to hold one allowance for every metric ton, and you only sell a limited number of allowances, then you're forcing them to sell only a limited amount of fuel. So it, there, we're not controlling, it wouldn't be controlling how each, how much each fuel supplier is able to sell, but as a, as a unit in the state of Maine, you'd be limiting that. Michael? Uh, he answered my question about cap and trade. Oh, perfect. I got uh, just two uh, questions. Sure. Well, the first one has to do with our neighbors to the west, north, and east of us. So Quebec and New Brunswick, uh, sometimes, well, when we're not in a pandemic, uh, come over here for the cheaper gas and, uh, and cheaper milk. I believe milk is still cheaper in the U.S. than over in New Brunswick. Um, but uh, if those allowances would force that cost to be pushed to the consumer, would it potentially make it so that the gas in Canada is now cheaper than the gas in the US or was that something that they analyzed when looking at the TP, uh, TCIP? Uh, it's a really good question. Um, something that a lot of the um, jurisdictions have been studying right now is actually if we end up with a patchwork TCI where like the state of Maine joins but New Hampshire doesn't and Vermont joins but you know Pennsylvania doesn't or New York does. So. <laughs> they're studying people like on the border, on the border of states, if they can just hop over and is that, it, would that be worth it? And would it defeat the program? Um, and, and it sounds like a, a reasonable argument, right? But the, the Transportation and Climate Initiative is expected to 
result in an increase in the price of gasoline of anywhere from five to nine cents, which is well within even the annual variation in, in gas prices. So I could see that happening in the case of like a 50, a 50 cent increase, maybe even like a 35, 40 cent increase, but not with what the TCI is doing. Second uh, follow-up question on that is uh, Commissioner Johnson and the Department of Economic and Community Development put out last year the 10-year plan uh, to the governor's office. Uh, and in that, it talks about addressing climate change and, and emissions and things along those lines. Hmm. How does the TCIP compare and contrast to the state's own 10-year uh, plan that the DECD put out? Hmm. I'm familiar with the four-year climate action plan. I'm not familiar with the 10-year, though. Um, I'll put the uh, the link in the little thing okay. on the side. Yeah, I, sh I should be aware of that, so so thank you. I'm surprised I haven't heard of that. But I do know that the, um, I mean, I listed the, the act with the state's emission reduction goals, and, and I know that in the four-year action, climate action plan, at least, um, the state is planning to do um, things with public transportation and and rebates if, if my memory serves correctly and thank you for that link no problem it should be right over on the uh the side there and i believe michael's got his hand up michael yep um question on your thesis just looked at uh, transportation issues not uh, home heating or anything like that yeah the the transportation and climate initiative would affect um gasoline, retail gasoline that ends up at the pump as well as diesel fuel. Um, so it wouldn't affect heating oil. Okay. Uh, did you do any research on the demo demographics is probably the wrong word, but basically the uh, age of cars in rural, rural communities versus the age of cars in, in uh, urban communities, mm. particularly I with didn't... respect to uh, fuel economy and old cars don't tend to, to use a little bit more gas than the new ones. And the people in the rural communities tend to have older cars. Yeah. Yeah, it's a really, really, really great question. Um, so I didn't have access to the data of the year of the vehicle by county. So my classification of rural versus urban was by county and it wasn't an ideal way to do it. But the way that I um, calculated the elasticity estimate, which I needed to determine how much households would be expected to reduce um, gasoline consumption, was by um, splitting things up into counties and finding demographic data for each of those counties. So I had a statewide estimate of the, the year of the vehicle, which doesn't in and of itself tell you about the fuel economy. Um, for fuel economy itself, I, um, I calculated that using a vehicle miles traveled estimate from the Department of Transportation from um, 2015. And then I multiplied how, how many miles the average Mainer drives by the number of licensed drivers and um, mathematically calculated what the, the average fuel economy would be for the, for the entire state. Um, so I had to hold that constant across, across the entire state which undoubtedly did affect um, my results. So it's an excellent, excellent question. And the data for um, zip code level fuel economy was released after I had finished 85% of my thesis, maybe 90%. So at my defense, my advisor said, by the way, we, we, we have this new information now. Um, which I would have loved to have, have used, obviously, um, but it wasn't available at the time that I did my study. Interesting. Thank you very there. much. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Any other, other questions? Thank you very much, William. Much appreciated. Absolutely. And page 16 is where they talk about climate change, and I think the focus is on battery development for for transportation. So maybe that ties into the TCIP uh, plan at some point. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Last but definitely not least, Miranda Snyder. Welcome to uh, the Maine Masonic College. We're excited to hear your presentation. The floor is yours. Hi, um, I 
thank you all for having me. I'm sorry I was a little bit late. I got my second dose of the vaccine, which was wonderful. I had sent Stephanie, thank you. I had sent Stephanie a video recording of my presentation that I had made. So for the sake of brevity, if Stephanie, you wouldn't mind playing that and then I'll be open for any questions afterwards. Way to plan ahead. Thank you. I know I was nervous about a reaction or something, but there I have that. So for the sake of brevity, I think that would be best to play that recording I had made. Yeah, I will. Okay. Um, hold on. Let me share my screen and then I can move along on this. Here we go. All right. Can everybody see that? Should, yeah. Yes. All right. Here we go. I apologize that I cannot be there with you this afternoon. However, my thesis that I will be discussing is titled How Alumni of a Feminist Organization in Middle to High School Perceived Their Involvement and as Related to Their Academic Self-Concept. As shown on the slide, this qualitative study sought to provide a greater understanding of how youth perceive hmm. It's probably buffering org to relate to their academic self-concept during the years of middle to high school. Six Whoops. alumni of Hardy Girls Healthy Women's Girls Advisory Board were in I'm trying to shut down uh, other things. Hardy Girls Healthy Women is a main based okay. nonprofit that focuses on empowering hmm. girls by teaching them critical thinking skills and providing them opportunities to make change. All alumni identified as white, cisgender, female, and all but two were involved in Hardy Girls Healthy Women Girls Advisory Board, the leadership board for this organization, for four years. All the interviews were conducted over Zoom video conferencing following IRB approved protocol. The broad findings, which I will get into in a bit, indicated that these alum were called community-oriented affordances of activism, a high worth ethic in academics and activism, an increased personal understanding and empowerment through the activist work they did at, as a part of GAB, and a multifaceted academic self-concept that incorporated their own and others' perceptions to broadly answer the research question to concur, yes. Indeed, they did perceive their involvement in the Girls' Advisory Board to relate to their self-concept and academic self-concept more specifically. There were four major themes that encapsulated the findings of my interviews. All interviews were coded and then there were narrative profiles written of each participant to give a sense of how their holistic experiences reflect these common understandings. I will break down each of these themes and their sub themes in order for you to get a better sense of them. Theme one, affordances of activism. All participants mentioned a sense of community that affirmed their involvement and interest in activism, specifically in the girl identity focus activism of the Girls Advisory Board. All participants also mentioned role models and mentors as especially influential in this in showing them that they too could contribute meaningful activist work to the space. Theme two, worth ethic and academics and activism included the sub themes of a sense of pride in seeing the results of hard work, whether it was working for a year with other members of GAB to execute the triannual Girls Rock Conference or inherent interest in an academic subject relating to motivation to succeed in that subject. Theme three, personal understanding of and empowerment via activism was also felt across the board by participants. As participants grew more involved in the Girls Advisory Board and other activism efforts, they developed a better sense of what activism and feminism meant to them personally and also after hearing other folks share their experiences and personal understandings of it too. So currently, their view of themselves as an activist also increased in this, since as they executed more action related to such or as other people they admired, they are more likely to feel more confident labeling themselves as such. Finally, they felt more confident in their personal voice and using their voice to advocate for themselves in and out of activist settings. For instance, Gab's emphasis on using one's voice to participate in discussions about activist and social justice topics led several participants to feel more confident for advocating for themselves in their classroom using their voice, such as asking for additional instruction or participating more in a discussion. 
Finally, theme four represents the academic self concept in the participants perception of their academic self. This self perception ebbed and flowed in different situations according to who was in the classroom with them, the subject, their previous interest in it, etc. There is also their personal perception of themselves compared to their perception of how others achieved compared to their own. So the major themes and findings of my study caused me to draw the following conclusions as represented in this diagram and in the following implications as listed on the slide. So first, all participants became aware of how their interests aligned with activism, such as one participant's fascination of Susan B. Anthony being related to the gender politics she was seeing play out on a national scale. Then they join a group as a result of seeing a role model or mentor being involved, being recommended to join, or attending prior events, such as the Girls Rock Conference. In the group, they then work with peers from different backgrounds, and in doing so, learn more about the complex ways that activism can be done and how each person understands it. Finally, they see the results of their hard work, and in doing so, feel a sense of pride and capability. As a result, they're more likely to label themselves as an activist and use their sense of confidence as seen in personal voice in other realms, such as in the classroom. My findings also caused me to craft the following suggestions for youths and their schools. So first, I broadly recommend that youth become involved in youth-led and identity-related organizations. By becoming involved in youth-led organizations, they may feel a sense of pride and accomplishment in executing action without requiring adult guidance to do so. In identity-related orgs, they may feel a sense of positive identity development and fulfillment. Schools should make sure to diversify the offerings of activism opportunities they provide to the students. This may include opportunities such as service learning or more speak out events in order to ensure that all students are engaged and all students can find their own motivation and excitement in joining. Finally, schools should also increase self-driven learning opportunities for students, such as offering senior projects or more creative assessments in courses. As a result, they may encourage more growth-oriented academic self-concept versus ones of comparison, as felt by my participants. Thank you very much for listening to this bit of my research. If you would like to email me further or have any questions, if I am unfortunately not able to attend for the question session, my email is miranda.snyder at maine.edu. Again, that follows M-I-R-A-N-D-A dot Snyder, S-N-Y-D-E-R, at maine, as in our lovely state, dot edu. Thank you all so much for having me, and I hope you have a good rest of your day. Bye. Okay. Thank you. Apologies for the awkward buffering, but we got through it. <laughs> Questions for Miranda. I have one to kick us off. Surprise, surprise. Um, my question is, to implement that first suggestion that you had in your list of three suggestions, yeah. do you have um, any thoughts on how to potentially do that in more rural spots of the state that may not have access to some of these youth-led uh, organizations, leadership organizations and activist, activist organizations. What are your thoughts on, on that? Yeah, definitely. So Hardy Girls Healthy Women, which as I said, is based in Waterville, is obviously in a more urban area of the state. But in terms of implementing and encouraging youth to get involved in these projects, I looked at a lot of research obviously looking at the effects and the impact of youth being involved in these orgs, usually, of course, focused on youth who are at risk, who benefit most from being a part of them. Um, so that's in more urban centers usually, but in the rural sense, they can have been still been proven to benefit by being exposed to conversations about these ideas. So even reading about other young people getting involved, being interested in these issues has been shown to impact them because it gives them the same sense of accomplishment and same sense of they can achieve something in this realm on issues that are important to them. So it's more so exposing them versus, of course, they aren't able to travel to say like travel however many hours south to Portland if we're thinking about rural Maine to participate in a similar um, group, but still there are just um, in the fall, I spoke at the Maine Youth Action Network conference, which was a virtual conference, which granted in a rural area of bandwidth and broad width, that's more difficult for them to engage in, but there still is that exposure too. Wonderful, thank you. And there is a question from Michael McDonald in the chat. 
what does activism and feminism mean to you? Parentheses, part of your slide talked about getting the young women to define their definition of active, activism and feminism. I'm interested in your definition. Yeah, so I actually was inspired to undertake this project um, because in my senior year of high school, I actually formed my high school's first ever student feminist club too. So I'm very, very interested in, of course, and I'm studying to be a teacher right now to a high school English teacher. So I'm very interested in how um, youth being interested in these issues, particularly gender identity based issues um, can impact them from my experience too. So, and then in college, I went on to be co-chair of the feminist collective, the student feminist group at the University of Maine too. So really seeing, I'm interested in tracing how the involvement and undertaking of action related to issues that's important to someone's personal experiences. Of course, my personal experiences in my senior year of high school in college when I was co-chair of the Feminist Collective, most clearly aligned with gender-based, gender identity-based discrimination with me having been a white cisgender woman myself. Um, so that is to say, my personal definition of feminism as a whole is just fighting for the equality and equity for folks of any gender, any um, racial ethnicity, any socioeconomic status, any sexual orientation as a whole, coming it from a place of your lived personal experience. So for me, of course, I come from my lived personal experience of being a white cisgender woman. Um, so that affects the issues I advocate on, which leads me to, of course, have in high school, started my high school's first feminist organization too, because it's rooted in your own personal experience. Awesome, thank you. Other questions or thoughts? May I ask which high school you're from? Yeah, I'm actually from Massachusetts. So I'm from Tantasqua high, Regional High School in um, Mass. Awesome, awesome, awesome. I've, yeah, got, the reason I... uh, I've got a question and a comment, if you don't mind. Yes, of course. Uh, are you aware that the Masonic Fraternity uh, has a youth organization called the Rain the International Order of the Rainbow for Girls, and it's just for young women. I've I've um, heard of Rainbow Girls too, but I did not know specifically that the Masonic um, fraternity had that as well. That's so interesting. Thank you. It's uh, it's an organization that is led by the by the young women. Great, awesome. And because uh, they have adult advisors. Yeah. And we've just now um, opened it up to uh, sexual orientee. Mm -hmm. we're, we're, we're kind of touching that right now because of because of a lot of young people now. Um, I'm an advisor, you know, awesome. state level and uh, very good talk on that. And, and the girls they're very strong in the Waterville area, actually. They're very strong in the Waterville area. That's where our grand worthy advisor. Yeah. Is. yeah. So it's a. Uh, yeah, thank you. I, yeah. I love that super. And the girls, I can relate to them. You know, I can relate to them because they're very, uh, very strong in that, in that, in that organization. And, yeah. Yeah. It's good. You know, that's a good point, Frank. Um, the International Order of Rainbow Girls could be something because there are a lot of lodges in the rural areas of the state, right? Piscataquis County, Aroostook County, Penobscot County, and an initiative to start some of these organizations that are run by young women could be a good way of helping move this needle that Miranda's talking about. So we yeah. see a lot of young we see a lot of young girls come into the rainbow girls at the age of 11 years old and very shy and very uh very uh i want to say preserved and by the time they move up through the organization and become a leader and more of an outspoken they're great speakers they're fantastic moms they're uh great in their communities, active in their communities, and uh, they they go on to do great things. Uh, Olympia Snow was a rainbow girl. Margaret Chase, if you want to go back, Margaret Chase Smith was a rainbow girl. Mm -hmm. uh, 
and I can go on and on and on on uh, on some of them that uh, that are very well spoken. Yep. Awesome. Thank you, Frank. Other questions or comments? Miranda, I have I have one. Um, so I've I've studied some social movements, and I've actually, you know, been an administrator and faculty meeting uh, member at UMaine. And so one of the things that we've given great thought to over the years is how to, um, I guess the word would be uh, collect people and maybe, um, you know move from intention to activism or behavior. And one of the things that I was listening to in your talk is that you formed in high school, a group, and I can't remember what it was called, but um, I guess I'm wondering, do you feel like that activist, th activist groups, maybe feminist activist groups or environmental climate change activist groups can work if they're instituted top down or do they have to have a champion, like an inspired from the grassroots champion in order to really move from intention to, to actual behavior? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, no, that's a really, really wonderful question. I, in doing prep and of course, reading around um, like social organizing theory and things for looking at the historiography of how feminist groups are traced in youth groups and then just feminist organizing in particular in preparation and just around my thesis as I was learning more about it. Um, there, it depends on the mode of critique that you come at from because of course if you're coming at it from like say a Marxist critique then you're very critical of the top-down approach. However, in terms of the youth organizing and youth led missions um, and youth led structures of the groups that I was a part of in high school, the one that I led and also the one that is modeled in my study and I'm co um, advising students for gender equality, which is similar club at Bangor High School right now where I'm student teaching. Um, so in that sense, there is the top support from the advisors, giving the students resources however they can. But in say, cause it's my current work in um, co-advising students for gender equality at Bangor High School, I offer them supports based on my previous work with the Feminist Collective at UMaine of like, these are organizations that I have connections with that have worked well for me in the past, but you, the students and the part of it, you are the one sending out emails. You are the one contacting the principal to make the events happen. You are the one, um, advocating for and making an action plan for these different steps and for things you want to see happen at the school. So I more so aim to provide resources and mentorship, but not do it in a way that is that top down approach that can, according to some critiques more than others, um, disempower, especially young people in particular looking at that. So I try to balance the two in particular um, of that top down approach, of course, having a top as a model and guide, but also allowing that more grassroots element for them to feel empowered so they can eventually become the people who are those models and mentors versus the top instructing how to do everything. I oh, go ahead, Stephanie. Sorry about that. Oh, no worries. You go ahead. I'll, I'll I was just going to say uh, in my work as a, as a school administrator, um, mm. and from my own personal experience, I've found that to be helpful, and in organizations as well, that if you empower the ground up and students, uh, it gets them excited and engaged, and you have that guidance, like you said, from the top down and the bottom up, because at, at some point, people age, right? The top down, you got to have some type of succession plan to keep the, the mission and the vision and the direction of uh, your passion uh, going. You're going to see a cat in a second. Sorry about that. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I think that's I think that's really insightful, and I hope you consider staying in Maine to teach. Um, let me just move this cat. Hi, everybody. This is fun. There we go. Um, so, I, I hope you you consider uh, staying in Maine to to teach. Yeah, wherever I get a job. Wonderful. I, that goes for everybody else who, who is here at the Honors College. We need folks working on uh, that governor's 10-year plan, whether it's in climate change or transportation and logistics. We need folks to, um, to be working on uh, whether it's finance or, or uh, 
biology and genetics through the Jackson Lab and NDIVL, or even having artists here who help inspire, uh, I think that's great. And I just want to, as the Dean of the Masonic College, thank um, Dean Welcomer for, for allowing uh, you guys, or bringing you guys all in to share this with us. So thank you guys very much. This is one of my favorite parts of Celebration of Arts and Sciences. And very impressive, very impressive. Great. They're a great group. I, I'm so happy that they they joined us and talked with you. And I'm really happy for all of your presences here today. Thank you. Very generous and thoughtful. And honestly, I think all of the students um, will have learned a lot today and um, took great pleasure from sharing this time from, with you. Thank you. Our pleasure, our pleasure. Before we go, um, I would like to be able to give the mic to uh, past Grandmaster of the Grand Lodge of Maine. Uh, he is a Regent Emeritus. He started the Maine Masonic College. Uh, Walter, are there any words that you'd like to, to share before we sign off today? Well, look, I would really like to ask a question of all of the uh, presenters today. Uh, during you were looking back now at four years of, of college, how has the honors program itself impacted your experience uh, as a uh, undergraduate? It, Great question. You think back and think of experiences where the honors program was essential or, or useful, at least, in making this experience a an integrated and important thing in your life. Great question, Walter. Would anyone like to hop in on that one? I could hop in on it. So my experience has been pretty unique because I'm a student athlete here at the University of Maine. And I came in very wary of being defined by either my sport or my studies and the best part about the Honors College for me was uh, it allows you connect with people from all sorts of majors with all sorts of backgrounds and you get to have conversations that you would never have otherwise. And it, it comes from a place of a very deep intellectual thought and the curriculum is, is fun and that you learn things you might never have picked up on your own. And then you get to have those conversations with people who might not have picked it up on their own or they might know a lot about it and they're coming at it with a perspective completely different from yours. So ultimately it gave me a community that has been essential to my personal, personal development because it's allowed me to um, find an outlet for everything I am beyond being an athlete and uh, a finance major because I, I can be stereotyped in ways that don't fit me as a person and I, I was able to express myself in ways I, I otherwise wouldn't have without the honors college. Wonderful. Thank you, Cam. Uh, William, I see your hands up. We'll go to you next. Yeah, I just want to echo what Cam said. I, I think that the best friends that I've ever had and the best faculty that I've met all came from the honors college. Uh, the honors college um, quite literally changed my life and my life trajectory um, in, in some really incredibly meaningful ways. I would have never read the texts that I had read if it weren't for the Honors College. And those texts dramatically changed my viewpoints on, on a lot of things. Um, just a lot of things um, coming into college. And so I'm, I'm eternally grateful for what the Honors College gave me. Um, and, I, and I take that perspective with me out into the world. Wonderful, thank you, William. Cora. I am uh, kind of in the same boat as Cam in the fact that I'm also an athlete as well. And um, I really like the Honors College because I actually, uh, I kind of enrolled here with already many AP credits from high school. So um, my parents really didn't want me to take Honors College because then they're like, well, what about all the APs you took? But in the, uh, in the end, I'm really happy because not only was I able to branch out beyond engineering by actually doing a creative thesis, which I wouldn't have been able to do if I wasn't in honors, but it helped me basically, as everybody else has said, see others' viewpoints 
And it really helped round me out and help me discover myself as a person. Because when I came here, I felt like I was basically like an offshoot of my dad, because <laughs> that's like the only input I was ever receiving. And then coming here, I got to meet so many different people, so many different viewpoints. And it wasn't just engineering or just my sport. It was accumulation of everything that's kind of here at UMaine. And it was, it was a fantastic experience. Wonderful. Thank you. You know, that's an interesting thing that I'm hearing between all these uh, uh, smarter people than I am in that one of the things that has disturbed me the most in my lifetime is when I went through college, there was a lot of diversity, exchange of ideas, and we did so and debated and talked. Nowadays, it doesn't seem like you can do that anymore. And I find it discouraging, but then I'm hearing from you guys, you're hearing different points of views and that discussion is still ongoing. And I kind of needed to hear that because one of my biggest concerns is people aren't talking and, and I don't care if you disagree with me or not, I want to know what you think. Um, you might be right. And that's my biggest fear. I'd rather know the truth than be right. So it's good to hear that you guys are uh, have that dialogue going on because I wasn't necessarily convinced it was happening anymore. So that's cool. Absolutely. Gives you hope. So Bailey or Miranda, would you guys like to add anything else before we wrap up today? Yeah, sure. I think I echo everything that's already been said. I think the Honors College has pushed me both in terms of depth and breadth. You know, it's pushed me outside of my comfort zone to, you know, have these other conversations and, you know, study in areas that are outside of my primary discipline and just open my mind. Um, and then also it's allowed me to go even deeper into my own, you know, field of study within biochemistry by allowing me additional research opportunities. And finally, it's allowed me additional leadership and service opportunities in my current role as an honors ambassador, which is a new program in the honors college. I've been able to work with other fellow ambassadors and Melissa Leidenheim, the associate dean, to you know, really take on these causes that we're passionate about, like our current personal care product um, campaign. So it's really just pushed me in every way. And yeah, I'm incredibly grateful for my experience in the Honors College. Thank you, Bailey. Miranda? Yeah, the thesis in particular is something that was really, really special to me because like I said, I am studying to be a teacher. Um, so Standardly, I do my student teaching, which I'm doing right now, but normally in my standard program, I would not execute a capstone or a large research project on my own. So the thesis allowed me to merge my past address, as you all know now, in um, like student advocacy, specifically around the issues that I chose to study in my thesis. And um, of course, education and academic self-concept and merging them in a really, really unique way that showed me my own strengths as um, a researcher and as a critical scholarly writer that I would not have known before. Awesome. Thank you very much. And with that, that concludes our 2021 Celebration of the Arts and Sciences. Hope to see you all again next year. And we look forward to seeing the Honors College uh, with us next year. And with that, everybody, have a wonderful day and enjoy the rest of this sunshine. Take care. Bye-bye.